Okay, Alex. So just let us know whenever we're live. And we're we're live now, and it looks like it's still adding folks uh, to the attendees. I think we've stabilized at about 25 attendees. Okay, I'll, I'll so go ahead like and get started. started. Yeah, while people join. Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the August 13th, 2020 meeting of the Board of Architectural Review Small, City of Charleston. My name is Jay Claypool. I'm going to chair tonight's meeting. Uh, the other board members present with us tonight are as follows uh, Bill Huey, Phil Moore Wilson, Julia Martin, and Glenn Gardner. Uh, city staff present in the meeting is our planning director, Jacob Lindsay, uh, Alex Howell, Linda Bennett. The um, staff comments you're gonna hear tonight have been prepared by Kim Lavin, Alex Howell, and Jacob Lindsay. The order of the meeting um, is consistent with our past meetings and it, it is as follows. Staff will give a brief introduction of the project, uh, after which the applicant and anyone on behalf of the applicant collectively uh, will have a 10 minute uh, period of time in which to present the application. Uh, everyone speaking, please, clearly state your name for the record. Um, if anyone uh, for the project intends to speak, please do it at that time and not sort of follow up in public comments. This is the applicant's period of time in which to speak. Uh, after the applicant presentation, we'll have a public comment period of 10 minutes. Again, anyone wishing to speak, please state your name clearly for the record. Uh, staff will then present uh, its comments and recommendations. The applicant, after hearing from staff, after hearing from the public, We'll have an opportunity to clarify uh, any parts of its application or to respond to any issues raised in public or staff comments uh, in, a, in a five minute window period of time after that. Uh, at that point in time, the floor closes and then the board will deliberate and eventually vote on the matter. The board is free to ask questions of the applicant, of staff, the public, anyone uh, at any time. Our past practice has begin has been to begin asking those questions immediately on the heels of the um, the applicant's presentation. There's been no uh, agenda items deferred or withdrawn, so we have a full agenda tonight. So I'll just ask um, anyone to uh, from the applicant for any applicant. Um, you, you know, I talked about your windows of time. If you don't need the time, you no know, need to take it. Um, please, public, keep your comments uh, to the point. Board members will try to. Um, engage in a, a point full and, and uh, discussion as well. Um, reminder to myself, turn off my cell phone, please everybody else do the same. Um, and then lastly, as to public comments, um, please limit your comments to architecture. Um, that's our purview and our only our purview, uh, nothing related to um, traffic, stormwater, et cetera. So with that, um, the first agenda item tonight is 74 Cooper Street, or unless, uh, Jacob, did you want to have some rules of the road here? Well, um, uh, absolutely, and Mr. Chair, um, you're welcome to read these. Uh, I don't know who we're doing it BRS and L, but um, the chair run, runs through these. Uh, it's whatever you prefer. I can run through these as well. Okay, I'll, I'll do it real quick. We've already gone through the, uh, the address and how you join the meeting. Um, let's see here, uh, if you go to the next slide. So staff, and that's going to be Alex, I believe, is going to control the PowerPoint. Um, that's actually that's actually me, Mr. Chair. I'm controlling the PowerPoint. So if anybody who's presenting just wants to say next slide, I'll make sure to do that. Okay. So Jacob's controlling the PowerPoint. Please ask him when you're ready to move on through through the slides. Um, the only people who are able to speak are those who are promoted to speaker, and and so we're trying to keep an orderly meeting. That'll be uh, the people who have signed up to speak. Um, everyone else will be on mute. Um, Let's see here. Um, okay, we're going to go down the agenda. Please stay in the meeting for the completion of the item so you don't disrupt each agenda item. Um, staff will call on you when it's your turn to speak. And then um, uh, all the board members are participants so we can uh, see each other and communicate through Zoom. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to ask the board members for a motion as I've done in the past Zoom meetings. I'll call the roll um, at each vote. And if you could remember to please say your name um, and then either vote yay in favor or nay in favor, nay not in favor, um, so that we are very clear as to how each of us has voted. Uh, anyone needing to recuse, uh, basically we'll, we'll pull you out of the meeting 
uh, and put you back in for the next agenda item. Uh, in the unlikely event we need to go into executive session, we'll get into a separate conference line and Alex can arrange that. Um, and I believe that's it. These, excuse me, these proceedings are being recorded. So everyone uh, be aware of that. So with that, we'll go to the first agenda item. Okay. Very good. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and first of all, it's great to be here with you in the VRS. I don't often get the privilege of being here with all of you. So thank you very much. Um, Ms. Lavin will be returning from, uh, from her maternity leave at our next meeting. But in the meantime, it's great to be here. So um, agenda item number one is 74 Cooper Street. And this is a demolition request for two existing structures. These are not rated in our category system. They're on the east side, in the east side neighborhood. They were built between 1910 and 1930. And these are outside of the board's review for, um, for new construction, but they are within the demolition review uh, due to their uh, historic nature. So you can see here, these are located on the north side of Cooper Street between Hanover and Aiken, immediately adjacent to the old Cooper River Bridge District and uh, right in the middle of the east side. The existing site photos show, this is again looking from Cooper Street, the condition of these buildings. Um, I know that some of the board members were able to go on a site visit earlier today. You can see that uh, the overall uh, condition is, is quite poor. This is looking down Cooper Street and we're gonna flip and look in the other direction. So this is just a little context for you here. This is across the street. Um, this shows the, the overall uh, conditions in terms of when these were built and you can see here in terms of classification that these are not rated in, uh, in our system. Um, overall, these are, these are sort of provisional basic dwellings. These are not buildings that are, are rated for historical significance beyond uh, that, um, that status. And uh, with that said, that will end the uh, introduction and we can turn it over to the applicant for presentation. We, I, we, I believe we have the owner of the property here I will promote her to a panelist and I don't see the applicant. So maybe she can clarify. I believe we have um, Beth Blanchard um, as a panelist and you can unmute yourself. And I just unmuted and I think, okay, now I think I'm in, in real world, although that's not yep. my real background. Um, I am the owner of the property. I'm Beth Blanchard. I've had the property for many, many years. Um, point being, I do have investors calling me, um, texting me continually to buy it for the purpose of investment property and rental. My intent has always been to build there, to live there. Um, I'm actually building it for my mother and I, so I'll be closer to work, she'll be closer to medical care. Um, like I said, I've held on to it for a long time for that purpose. Um, have no intention of renting. Um, the intent is to have parking underneath. I know that's an issue in the area. Uh, I have um, Sandy Byers is the architect on the project. He is trying to dial in. I am not sure if he has um, managed to get in yet. I don't see him yet. Um, I don't see him at, having joined the Zoom and I don't see him as called in either. Okay. Um, he was texting me saying it was not accepting his email, um, hmm. his email link name. And so he was trying to get in via the um, ID, meeting ID. I'll keep an eye out in case he um, calls in. I'm going to tell them to try to link directly from the Word document. Um, while he's trying to dial in, um, I will go ahead and kind of take some of his stuff that he was probably going to be addressing. Uh, I believe that um, members of the BAR visited the site earlier today and are probably very aware that it is sitting across a property line. Uh, so obviously um, that's gonna be an issue. If you look at the pictures, and I don't know if you're actually going through pictures in this process, but if you glance through the pictures, you'll notice that there is really no foundation under it um, that would allow us to be able to uh, attach to something to bring it up. 
Um, if you'd like to uh, direct me to the slides, if you're familiar with them, I'm happy to um, to use this slideshow. I assume that these were prepared by your architect, but happy to. Oh, and he is he is coming. I see him popping in now. Yep, Sandy is now a panelist, so he can unmute um, unmute his microphone and turn on a camera if he has it. Okay. And with that being said, I will turn it over to Sandy. I do believe. Okay, I'm not sure what is the deal is with my camera, but um, I can hear you. You can hear me. Okay. Um, I've spent an extensive amount of time at these buildings, looking at them inside out and under trying to inventory um, any materials that may be there that are worth uh, using again, trying to rebuild or try to build upon or just what's there that we might be able to salvage. And uh, I was not able to find really anything. Um, basically the only thing that we could possibly use are the brick that uh, remain in some of the foundation piers and also in the fireplace and chimney. There are a few of the siding boards that are still intact, but um, at the rear of the building on the north side, the roof is completely, uh, has faulted over the years and it has caused the entire rear of the building to, uh, to be uh, completely destroyed. Um, there is no uh, roof system left back there. The wall system has been deteriorated and all of the sills are gone as well. And Sandy, this is, this is Jacob here. If you'd like me to use any of your slides, just let me know and you can direct me to which slides you'd like to. Okay, thank you. Um, we have so many, I don't know. <laughs> but um, if you could show maybe some of those of the, the um, sills around the building. Uh, Sandy, can you see our video feed? Yes. Okay, good. So you can just direct me as needed. Let's see if I can enlarge that. It's so tiny. Um, These are just a series of interior shots here. Yeah, here on this one, the, the one above, you can see uh, most all of the seal members are in, in pretty... Um, pretty deteriorated condition. So that's pretty typical right there. Same there at the bottom. Same on top. Our concern is that um, because this building is over the rear property line that it would have to be moved, either relocated, rebuilt, or raised, or lifted. And in my opinion, there's no structure under the house for it to be lifted. You have to put those real heavy beams in there and lift it. So I, I feel like once they try to, to lift it with the beams, it's just going to completely collapse. So I don't think that's going to be a possibility. There you can see where the roof is faulted and um, destroyed floor system, roof system, floor, the entire back of the building. As far as the building on the front, um, I didn't get to hear your presentation as far as what you felt about that building, but it's really a mystery to me because it doesn't show up on any of the Sanborn maps. And it appears that it could be part of the building that was on the left at one point in time, or maybe there was a portion of that building that was moved onto the site. It just, it's hard to know exactly um, why that building has not shown up on any of the maps. Um, appears to be a very small original structure that's right on the front at the street and it's had two additions um, over the years um, and both of those were poorly done and they were not even built with proper uh, members for sills and that kind of thing. There's no sheathing on the building. They were flat roofs so again the, uh, the roofs have faulted 
structures have faulted. So there's really nothing there to, to save either. And if I can add, um, I think you should have a copy of the engineering report that was done by Rosen. And I think that'll kind of display how much of the structure they're viewing as, as usable in any way, shape, or form. Yes, ma'am. It's part of the submittal. We have it. Um, I don't you. want to cut. I don't want to cut y'all off. Is, does that conclude your presentation, or, or is there something outstanding about? No, I think I've covered it all. We'd just like to ask you all to allow us to take this building down so we can build something that's more appropriate and meets all the codes. Okay. Thank you. Um, does any board member have any questions right now? Nope. Okay. Uh, we'll get a staff, excuse me, we'll get a public comment then. We have one member of the public speaking on this item. Um, and I will allow Aaron Minigan to speak. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Thanks. Uh, Aaron Minigan, Preservation Society of Charleston. We would first like to thank the applicant for reaching out to us on this request and appreciate the opportunity to visit the site this morning. In a rapidly changing area of our city, this is an incredibly unique and interesting assemblage of structures that contribute to the neighborhood's historic character. While in poor condition, it's our hope that these buildings can be rehabilitated. We have seen previous examples of successful stabilization and restoration of buildings in far worse condition and ask that this request be denied. Thank you. Um, Alex, I have a letter here from a member of the public. I'm gonna read. Is there any other public comment first though? Um, that letter is the only other public comment. Okay, so we received a letter um, from Aaron Pope who writes in support of the demolition request at 74 Cooper. He writes that he lives near the site and frequently drives, walks the block. Approximately 10 years ago, I objected to the demolition of some of the historic structures on Cooper, hoping that redevelopment would target this area and the homes could be saved and restored. Unfortunately, few of the structures have been rehabbed or even maintained. The majority, including the buildings at 74 Cooper, have instead continued to deteriorate and are now threats to public safety and contributors to blight. I'm a certified planner and I feel that restoration should always be considered where possible. In this case, I simply do not think it is. Uh, Aaron Pope. Um, Beth and San, oh, I guess, no, Alex, we're uh, city recommendation and, and comments. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to go through our, our comments here. Um, first and foremost, these buildings have unfortunately suffered some deferred maintenance for quite some time, as you can see. Um, this is evident in the structural engineer's report as confirmed by the site visit. Um, second, both buildings have been greatly altered and there is very little salvageable, salvageable historic fabric remaining in either of the buildings. Um, to rehabilitate the buildings requires their elevation as well as relocation of the rear building off of the property line. And these buildings are in fact vestiges of Charleston's history and were not for their severe deterioration, um, it would be good to preserve them. Uh, with that said, the staff's recommendation is for approval of the demolition as submitted. Okay, um, Beth or Sandy, uh, do you want to clarify or respond to any public or staff comments? I don't have anything to add. I, I don't think I do either. Thank you, though. All right, so uh, we'll now go into uh, board discussion. Um, Bill, since you are on my far left, you, you want to kick us off? Um, yes, uh, Bill Huey. Um, I believe visiting the site this morning was most helpful. Um, I um, tend to agree with staff's comments, particularly in light of comment number two, the buildings have been greatly altered um, over many successive additions, or we can't quite tell, but it looks like quite a number of different, more contemporary building materials uh, interspersed within the buildings as well. Um, and that and the uh, deteriorating condition, I, I would support uh, and agree with staff's uh, recommendation. Um, I, I would tend to agree, this is Julia. I would tend to agree with all of that and um, just wanted to articulate that I do hear Preservation Society's 
concerns, and it's really unfortunate that these have been maltreated and neglected for so long since they are, you know, among the very few bits of history left in that location. Um, but again, I ultimately agree with staff. Okay, Fillmore or, or Glenn, any, any other comments? Fillmore Wilson here. Um, I tend to agree with staff too, and particularly since I think the buildings would require elevation and they're so small that um, the level of elevation would probably uh, alter the um, architecture to the extent that most of the uh, impact um, of saving the buildings would be lost. So I uh, reluctantly agree with staff. Yeah, and I not to take much more time, Glenn Gardner, I, I fully agree with Fillmore. I think that that's what hit it on the head for me. I, I am always very, very reluctant to feel like we're rewarding demolition by neglect because I think that it is something that's shameful. Um, but having looked at the site, the streetscape, I think the reality is once these buildings cross that 50% threshold and would have to be um, well up in the air, or at least that, that's my belief, um, correct me staff please if I'm wrong, I think at that point you, you've lost the character, unfortunately, of what um, they are or were. Okay. Can just make a motion for um, approval Please. of demolition with conditions noted. I'm sorry, no conditions noted. As submitted. But Julie's made a motion for approval for demolition as submitted. Is there a second? I'll second. Fillmore Wilson. All right, second. Uh, second by Fillmore. I'll go ahead and put it to a vote. Uh, Bill? Yay, in favor. Fillmore? Yay, in favor. Julia? Yay, in favor. Glenn? Yay, in favor. Chair votes yay, in favor. Motion passes unanimously. Um, next agenda item is 139 Wentworth. And just for clarity here, are you guys seeing my toolbar at the top? Did I go off of that? Yes. Yes. Let me see if I can get this back into full screen mode here. Let me try it one more time. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, the technical issues never. So as agenda item number two, um, 139 Wentworth Street. This is a request for approval for demolition of the existing structure. Um, the structure is not rated. It is in Harleston Village. It originally was, uh, the original structure is, uh, is pre-1902. It's in the old and historic district and there is an addition renovation that occurred around 1975. The structure is located on the south side of Wentworth Street in between Pitt and Smith. And here you can see uh, the structure in question directly across the street. This is uh, exactly to the west of the site. You can see in this case, the structure in question is to the left in the middle of that grouping. And this is looking east on Wentworth Street um, to give you a sense of context. Uh, so with that said, I'll turn this over to the applicant for a presentation. And I'll just note that Fillmore is recused on, on this agenda. <clears throat> All right, we have Jeremy Tate, who is now a panelist and can unmute. And he's also joined by Brittany Smith. Uh, this is Jeremy Tate, joined by Brittany Smith of Metters. Uh, thank you for uh, hearing this application. We represent the owner of 139 and also 137 Wentworth and are working in collaboration with Stephen Yablon Architects. I'd like to start by thanking the Historic Charles Foundation and Preservation Society, along with Mr. Dufford and Mr. Young, who represent the neighborhood for meeting with us through this process. Uh, we spent considerable time uh, looking at this project and, and analyzing it. We don't um, take demolition requests lightly, and we at first didn't start uh, going down that path. Um, but we did, as we kind of worked through uh, this project, uh, start leaning towards it. And Jacob, if you could, um, move the slides forward and we'll go past the narrative, go to the first the imagery. So again, just following up of what, what Jacob presented that uh, this area photographs of the subject property in question. Next slide, please. Uh, and a street uh, elevation, the north elevation. And it um, 
137 and 141 Wentworth streets respectively uh, are historic. Um, and, uh, and this building kind of uh, uh, has adapted over the years. I'll go through the history with you, but next slide, please. Um, it, the brick veneer was from 1975 and it abuts the, one, the 141 historic brick. Next slide. You can see how it kind of laps over uh, uh, and it has a mortar joint uh, to the brick. Next slide. Uh, just a close-up view of that. And the next slide, please. And then how it kind of pieces in around the historic cornice of 141. Next slide. Uh, as it moves uh, east, it it's pulled away slightly from 137 at the first floor. It has a corbeling of the brick veneer that steps out and that helps to terminate the siding uh, at the second floor level. At the first floor level, it is concrete masonry units, which you'll see in the next slide, please. You can see how the brick veneers tube into the, the concrete masonry units and they are uh, seven and five eighths by 15 and five eighths uh, dimension. Next slide, please. Uh, and you're looking up between 137 and 139 and you're seeing the underside of some wood furring and uh, some asbestos uh, siding above that. Next slide. Uh, the dimensions of the CMU. Next slide, please. Uh, as you come down the side of 137 and look uh, west, you're seeing the east back end of this building. And you're seeing stucco over CMU and asbestos uh, siding above. You're also seeing windows from 1975. Uh, next slide, please. And as you turn to the rear of the property, uh, this was modified in 2016, and there'll be pictures that we'll show later. Um, all the windows, the fenestration, the doors uh, are all from 1975, um, and it's stucco over masonry, and then it's stucco over wood, plow, plywood uh, cladding at the second floor rear. And you get a glimpse of the, the roof connecting and lapping over 141 Wentworth, and all slopes to that um, one collector box. Next slide, please. Uh, again, the rear elevation and how it attaches to 141 at the rear. Next slide, please. Close up view of that. Next slide. Uh, I show the interior pictures just to show the extensive nature of, of how this structure has changed over the years. This is the first floor. Um, this, is, this hall structure is composed of two units, a, a unit on the first floor and a unit on the second floor. Uh, in 2016, uh, extensive work was ta had taken place to put in steel beams. You can kind of see it in the bulkheads of the ceiling. It's a completely open floor plan except for a bathroom at the rear. Uh, there's no historic material left uh, in terms of uh, finished material. And at, along the first floor, we'll get into it uh, on future slides, but we did some investigation within those walls. Next slide, please. Uh, again, first floor looking towards uh, Wentworth Street. Next slide. Next slide. And next slide. This is the second floor looking back towards Wentworth and uh, to your left is the stairs going down to the street level. Uh, and then you've got a series of bedrooms uh, all in front of you and then coming down the east side. Next slide. And then uh, looking to the rear, there's a kitchen, again, bedrooms to the back. And all the interior finishes up here are, are modern finishes from 1975 or, or later. Next slide, please. Uh, front bedroom. Next slide. Another bedroom. Next slide. Uh, the back bedroom. Next slide. And next slide. And then the bathroom on the second floor. Next slide. So we did some investigation. Uh, the first series of pictures we're gonna show you are on the first floor. We opened up the gypsum and revealed metal stud framing. Next slide. And peeled back the insulation and, and you see the backside of the CMU. Next slide. Uh, we went further down uh, the east elevation and confirmed the same construction type. Next slide. And then we went to the front street side and looked up at the ceiling to reveal modern framing at the second floor. Next slide. And then uh, again, another opening further out in the middle of the room. Next slide. We did peek up in there and there's a little bit of a remnant of historic uh, framing that does exist in that location under the bedroom of the second floor. Next slide. And then we used our thermographic camera to 
uh, kind of rule out other areas and we used it to look at regular, regular intervals of framing and we ruled those out not containing historic fabric uh, on the first floor and second floor. Next slide, please. This is at the second floor in that east, northeast corner. Uh, we did look into those areas and, and there is historic uh, uh, corner braces uh, in the framing uh, and then looking at the backside of, of a little bit of uh, some board sheathing there. Next slide. And then looking up into the uh, framing at the second floor, that's modern framing. Next slide. And we get some remnants of a, a, some framing that did exist uh, as our belief that the roof was a different form uh, that got mo modified either in 75 or slightly before then. Next slide. Uh, coming down the east wall, there is a diagonal brace there, historic fabric. Next slide. And then further around to the rear, it's all uh, modern framing at that point. Next slide. And this is an in between the bedroom, kind of an interior wall between the bedroom and a front bathroom. Uh, and that shows the remnants of a, a rough opening of a window uh, in the framing, but it's been uh, infilled with modern framing around it and modern finishes surrounding that. Next slide, please. And then coming down again along the east exterior wall, uh, another opening where there is um, uh, historic framing. Next slide, please. Um, this is a property card. We, we did some research here just to understand what might exist, how this property may have uh, transformed over the years. Next slide. And uh, this is the Sanborn from 1902, and it does show a two-story dwelling at the front, a one-story hyphen, and then a two-story uh, uh, addition at the rear. Next slide. And then by uh, 1944, there's an automotive addition. The, it changed to a store, so it's a two-story uh, store with a two-story full addition at the rear. The hyphen's gone. The automobile is one story, and there's a sliver of two-story infill between the two. Next slide. A 1951 Sanborn, the store has been extended to the uh, west with a one-story addition, and there's a two-story addition directly behind what's once the uh, automo the, the garage, and that is now just listed as a one-story infill, and the first floor has been converted to cement block at this point in time. Next slide, please. And then this is an aerial photograph in 1973 at the top, and it shows a sliver of, of uh, opening uh, to the west of the building that later got infilled in 1975 and you arrive at the aerial photograph uh, we got to in 2020. Next slide. This is a diagram of how we believe the structure has evolved over the years. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we did find a newspaper article from 1975 that, that just documents the approval process of the second floor addition um, and some uh, other modifications that took place. Next slide, please. And same thing, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. And this was Hab's photo for 141, and it's uh, from 1977, so it shows what happened, a glimpse of what happened in 1975 remodel. Next slide, please. The article on 137, Wentworth, we do know that this is historic, and we want to respect that. Next slide, please. And current pictures of today. Next slide, please. And this is 2016 remodel to the rear. So we, we know that um, it did have as best as siding uh, even before 1970, uh, well, actually after 1970, 2016, they modified it significantly uh, in the rear. Next slide. And next slide. And so um, what the applicant is proposing is that they would like to, to propose a single family residence to go back on this property instead of uh, two, uh, end up, you know, two units. And they would like to um, elevate the structure to base flood elevation plus the freeboard and, and make a structure that's more compatible uh, and with the, the, the neighboring historic structures, um, build it back on the exact same kind of footprint. But in looking through it, we're asking for a demolition because the historic fabric that does remain is limited to historic framing at the second floor around the, the east uh, wall and portions of some of those bedrooms. But the majority of what is there now is uh, not historic fabric and it's not a, a, a well done building. Uh, so we, if I, you have anything else to add? Um, I will say that the last 
of um, 141 and 139, the buildings are actually not connected in between the two structures. I guess um, the roof membrane is overlapping the parapet, but um, we're not actually structurally attached. That's right. There's a gap. But um, that, we're open for any questions. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions right now? Board we, yeah, uh, this is Bill Huey, of course. I didn't hear that last bit that, that um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, the lady in the back said. She was away from the microphone. Yeah, I sorry. That was, that was Brittany. Something about the gap, and I was going to ask a question about that. Were you addressing the gap between 137 to 139? Yes. Can you repeat what you said? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. It, it was, I was addressing the gap between 139 and 141. Okay that there is actually a space between the buildings that they are not structurally relying on one another. Um, that the only attachment is at the front facade and the, um, the membrane at the roof overlaps the parapet, but they're not relying on each other structurally. Okay, thank you. And my question was regarding uh, the gap between 137 and 139. It looked like there was daylight in those photos. There is, it's, it's all open all the way up. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us what's going on with the wall of 137 and or Piazza or whatever? I'm trying to understand what was done at that time for a sort of a non-serviceable gap. Um, actually, it is a, <laughs> we've been looking at 139. It is open all the way up. We've been looking at the siding through there and it, um, but I haven't been on to the porch of 137. Okay, so, so for what we know right now, yeah. whatever the condition of the wall at 137 is, it was sealed in in 75. Yeah, we, we believe it has a uh, like a metal cladding that's kind of closing it off. Um, but certainly this is one owner that owns both. And so when the building is uh, removed, uh, the intent would be to, to properly deal with 137 uh, at the time that this new building would go back. Okay, thank you. And the, I guess my only comment to that would potentially be to staff. So I, I would believe that's a pretty important factor in whatever happens with this project going forward. Um, and I believe it should be a pretty distinct part of any kind of submittal is the address of how 137 is treated. Um, I have a question as well. And I realize that we review Demolition requests without regard to what might come next, but just given the context and my belief that we're in a flood zone, I'm just, I would just like to know, I assume the applicant has some notion of what they might like to replace this building. Um, and given, you know, the unique context of everything adjoining, I'd just like mm -hmm. to sort of understand generally where you want to head. Yeah, so, uh, so, so it's a fairly narrow lot and uh, they definitely want to um, build a structure that, that's not right at street level. They wanna elevate um, two base flood plus the freeboard so that they still have a, a closer relationship to the street like their neighboring properties would have. Um, they are gonna build on the, basically within the same footprint that it is now. Um, we've had conversations with zoning and that would require, and zoning seems to be supportive of it, but we'd have to go get a variance. Uh, to basically build and ex uh, uh, extend an existing non-conforming setback. Because if we comply with the setbacks, it, it really gets to uh, about a 12 foot wide structure there. So we wanted to come before you about the, the, the demolition request before we get too far down the road of designing uh, what would go back. And certainly part of going back would require us to go before the zoning uh, board, which would be a next step for us. Thank you. Any other board questions right now? All right, uh, if not, we'll go to um, public comment. We'll start with April Wood and she should be able to speak now. Thank you. April Wood, Historic Charleston Foundation. HCF has reviewed the request for demolition of 139 Wentworth Street and we have met with the applicant as well as the neighbors. While we agree that very little historic fabric remains at this property, 
We believe that the existing structure contributes to the historic character of this section of Wentworth Street. The loss of the structure would result in an unfortunate gap in the small row of structures. We are not comfortable supporting the demolition of the structure until the width and height of the new structure on the site is approved by the BZA. Without a setback variance, a new structure will be exceptionally narrow on the lot. Because of the deep lot, there is also risk that a new structure will be constructed set back from the street. Both circumstances will negatively impact the pattern of development on Wentworth Street. We recommend deferring this request for demolition until the BZA can hear this request and make a determination on the setbacks and height it will allow for new construction. Thank you. Next, we have Aaron Minigan. Thank you, Erin uh, Minigan, Preservation Society of Charleston. Uh, we appreciate the applicant reaching out to us on this project. While we acknowledge that there is not a great deal of historic fabric intact, we would like to support the concerns uh, expressed by the Harleston Village Neighborhood Association that I believe um, ha has been submitted in a letter and may be read after this. Uh, but we agree with the Neighborhood Association with regard to the lack of clear justification for demolition and the uncertainty surrounding the redevelopment of the site. We too are concerned about the presence of a vacant site with no immediate plans for infill. We, uh, we appreciate the presence uh, or the presentation of a massing concept that indicates a minimal increase in height, um, but we hope that more information can be provided prior to discussion of demolition. Thank you. Okay, um, Alex, unless there's no other, um, unless there's any other public comments, I'll read a number of the letters that we've received. No other speakers, just the letter. Okay, um, so as Aaron referenced, we received a letter from the Halston Village Association who writes that the Halston Village Association BAR committee on behalf of the Halston Village Association has reviewed the demolition request and is opposed to the demolition and has the following comments. As a matter of principle, they oppose demolition of buildings in Halston Village that are over 50 years old. Each of these buildings, even as they evolve, are part of the narrative that tells the story of our neighborhood. In recent years, several structures, though in scale with their surroundings and having aspects which contribute to the neighborhood, have been approved either for demolition or overly aggressive renovations. The resulting structures are those which are at the absolute limits of allowable height, scale, and mass, thus disrupting the pleasantly scaled rhythm of our streetscapes. In this case, we see a recently renovated building that seems from the pictures supplied in the application to be very nice, to be a very nice property, both inside and out, fits well within the scale of the block and blends architecturally with its neighbors. 139 holds an historic place in the collection of buildings that define the block of Wentworth Street and Harleston Village at large. They request the application for its demolition be denied. Uh, signed the Halston Village Air BAR committee comprised of David Dumas, Yvonne Fortenberry, and Jim Lundy. Another letter from um, George Kellis, uh, who writes that the following is information he can remember and is substantiated by his mother, Hamilton Rodman Kellis. Uh, my grandfather, George Kellis, bought the property in the 50s. My father, John Cantalus, opened his drugstore after graduating from NUSC College of Pharmacy at 139 Wentworth before 1953. His silent business partner was Arthur LaRue Hill. His parents, both pharmacists, married in 56 and moved into the second floor apartment above the pharmacy. He was born in 57 and we lived there until 1963. A few years later, my grandfather sold the building. It was then the existing brick facade was installed a laundromat opened downstairs with the apartment above. The Art Deco facade of the building was altered from an earlier Charleston house as shown in the photograph that dates to the time we lived there. My grandfather may have installed the Deco facade, but it probably was changed a decade prior to his purchase of the building. The stair to the second floor residence from the street was located where a piazza may have been to the west of the structure. The second floor interior spaces may have followed an earlier layout with the exception of the front windows. The floors were one by four pine, plain sawn. Uh, front room was a living room and then the dining room, bedroom and kitchen. There was a side porch. Scarboroughs that owned the old Rogers Mansion, the Atlantic Coast Life Building, uh, kindly allowed my parents to park their car off street in their old carriage house. I hope this information gives you insights to the chronology of 139 Wentworth. 
another letter from Philip uh, Dufford, who writes uh, that he lives at 143 Wentworth, uh, one narrow building, the former stable entrance of the Silas Rogers mansion, now the Wentworth mansion, separates his house from 139 Wentworth. Our block is anchored by four large properties, those being the Wentworth mansion, the former Red Cross building at 144, the Villa de la Fontaine at 138, and 13 Pitt. Supporting of these structures are the smaller properties on the street. Those smaller, these buildings present a similar proportion to the larger adjacent properties in height and mass, but are at a more diminutive scale. This provides for a pleasant rhythm of historic structures on this block of Wentworth. 139 Wentworth, though quite old, has been assessed to prove that very little of its historic fabric remains in an effort to justify its demolition. I asked the board to consider not the age of the timbers or the presence of historic plaster and lathe to justify its existence, but rather its physical presence as part of the streetscape and how it has historically played a role in lacing this south side of Wentworth together. This building is important in how it, in height, scale, and mass, joins up to the similarly proportioned facades to each side. These buildings as a grouping are character defining as they are what remain of a mid-block development of smaller homes, businesses, and services that were subordinate to the larger properties in the block. Within this grouping, the proportional relationship of one to the other is noteworthy. In considering the fate of 139, please consider it as not a standalone structure, but as part of a collection of historic buildings that exist quietly and harmoniously as a deferential backdrop to grander structures that surround. 139 Wentworth is significant as it contributes to the historic context of the streetscape. This demolition should be denied. Uh, Jonathan Kirkland of 137 Wentworth writes that he's opposed to the application for its demolition. He's been a resident of 137 Wentworth since November of 2013. During this time, I've learned much about 139 Wentworth. It was a laundromat in the 60s and 70s. There's even an old sink buried in the concrete on the first floor that was rediscovered during the latest construction on the building. It served as a training building and bunkhouse for Atlantic Coast Life until they sold the Wentworth mansion to its current owners. Currently, it serves as two residences. The building, which has been a part of our streetscape for many years, fits within the context of our block and contributes to the historic collection of buildings surrounding it. I see no reason for its removal and would regard its demolition as a loss to the delicate fabric of our neighborhood. Carol uh, Bartholo of 138 Wentworth uh, writes, his neighbors to 139 were opposed to the application for its demolition. This building, which has been a part of our streetscape for many years, fits within the context of our block. It contributes to the historic collection of buildings surrounding it. We see no reason for its removal and would regard its demolition as a loss to the delicate fabric of our neighborhood. And lastly, uh, Patricia Agnew of 131 and a half Wentworth writes that she opposes the application requesting that this property be approved for demolition. The building has been a fixture of our historic neighborhood for many years, enhancing the harmonious streetscape and blending with the unique collection of buildings surrounding it. Its demolition would be a loss to the delicate fabric of this community and its historic footprint. Okay, so that's um, public comment. Um, Alex or Jacob, could we go to um, staff comments and recommendation? Absolutely, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 139 Wentworth Street, uh, staff comments are, first of all, that the existing exterior materials and form date from 1975 when the original building was heavily altered to include uh, a new brick front facade, as you've seen. Uh, second, per the report, no interior historic fabric remains in the first floor and only limited interior historic framing remains on the second floor. And number three, um, during and following demolition, care should be taken to prevent damage to the neighboring historic masonry wall at 141 Wentworth, um, should the board grant approval. And finally, the staff recommendation is for approval of the demolition with the conditions noted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thanks, Jacob. Um, Jeremy or Brittany, do you want to respond to public comment or staff comment or clarify anything? I'd only like to say that, you know, I appreciate meeting with, uh, with those uh, that we met with Preservation Society, Historic Charleston Foundation and, and Philly uh, Dufford. We, um, we, we uh, it was not a surprise to us what their positions would be. Um, you know, for HCF, um, I think we believed it was out of order for us to go to uh, zoning at this point in time uh, and without a ruling from uh, whether or not we could demo the structure. Um, and so, and two other points were made. Um, certainly the, the, the position of the board is to look at the demolition, uh, not prejudiced by what a new building might be. And that'd be our, our only kind of rebuttal um, to public comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, let's go to board discussion and, um, and vote. I normally would start with Fillmore to kick off discussion, but he's recused. Um, Julia, can I put you on the spot? Just go down the line sure. one and start with your comments. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, this is, you know, deceptively complex request. Um, clearly the existing building is like a, a festival of weird decisions and objectively speaking, I've seen nothing to mourn if that building disappeared. However, I definitely hear, I definitely hear the hesitation on the part of the neighbors and the preservation groups. I mean, it seems like there should be, there is an opportunity to improve on the quality and the conditions of what's existing, particularly at that point of contact with the beautiful brick wall at the carriage house to the west. Um, and I just did a quick little search and it seems like at least when the new maps take effect, the new DFE wouldn't really be that far above grade. So in my mind, I can envision that there is an opportunity to do something new that would be appropriate, respectful, um, and definitely not worse than the existing contextual situation, but I, but I really understand the hesitation on the part of everyone to just allow this to disappear with no notion of what comes next. So in my mind, it almost is a candidate for deferral um, because, you know, given all the concerns, I, there might be a chance it gets denied as is. Whereas if I, I think that if you were able to resolve zoning and come back with something that that we could see, I think it might color the outcome, whether or not that's officially how we're supposed to, to analyze these things, the make our decisions. It's just my take on it. Okay, other board comments? I'll go next, Glenn Gardner. Um, I 100% I agree with Julia. She said most of what I had to say. Um, to me, it's very important to recognize the character of the streetscape here, where I think the streetscape is more important in this case than the quality of the actual building that's been applied for demolition. Um, the building itself does not have some overwhelming uh, merit of quality, but I think the quality it lends to the streetscape itself with the scale is critical. And so um, I am personally opposed to agreeing to lose that without having any knowledge of what could potentially come back here. And I, I fully understand where we are as a board and we have to, uh, to judge demolition on its own. Um, but at the same time, I see no overwhelming push uh, to demolish this building without further knowledge because I don't see a structural reason that it's going to fall into the street or create any type of hazard. Um, so that, that's where I, I, I am really in the camp of, I would support a deferral for additional information. Otherwise, um, I would probably be opposed to the application. Um, this is Bill Huey. Uh, I, I agree with the previous comments by Julia and Glenn, um, and I really just have one question, I believe, of staff. Um, and it's more or less a procedural sort of car, cart and horse kind of question, but um, getting to the point of um, that zoning approval, that pending zoning approval, um, is a deferral uh, the, a deferral from this board would not necessarily constitute an issue from that zoning review standpoint for, I believe, would be a new construction, correct? Um, good question. And the, in this case, the BZA and zoning staff would actually request that this board render a decision first. And the reason is that that request for the new project is a request regarding a new project. So that request, in fact, has no merit and could not proceed until there had been an acknowledgement that the existing project could, and the existing building could, in fact, be demolished. So I would say this, um, that if, if you all render a, a decision that 
speaks to that matter that you would like additional clarity from the BZA and from the zoning administrator, I'd be happy to look into it, talk to our zoning administrator um, and prevent, you know, come back to the board with, uh, with an opinion in that regard. But the BZA isn't going to consider that, that request at the moment because they can't consider the, such a hypothetical thing. The site is not cleared. So they would ask for you to act first. However, I'm happy to talk to the board administrator and come back to you. Thank you, Jacob. And I guess to follow up with that, um, eventually this board, BARS, will have purview over the new design review as well, correct? That's correct. Therefore, any issues of height, scale, mass, et cetera, would be reviewed and or subject to the approval of, of this board. That's correct. Thank you. So um, would it be appropriate if I made a motion for deferral for more information regarding zoning feasibility of rebuilding in a similar footprint, something to that effect? Is that a question for staff? Yeah. Okay. Um, Jacob, let me ask you a question. Can are, are we talking about getting an opinion from the zoning administrator or, or, or what zoning, the zoning administrator would recommend, you know, or what information can we ask for from the zoning administrator to help make a decision? As a board, you, well, as a board, you could, um, you can ask anything you'd like of the zoning administrator, just as any member of the public could do so. Um, what, what I will go ahead and, and uh, maybe, maybe I'll be a little bit more clear. The BZA is not going to render an opinion on a hypothetical project. So they're not, the board will not hear this until you have granted demolition permission. However, I can get you an opinion from the zoning administrator as to um, what is allowed on the site if it were to be uh, totally clear. So happy to talk to Lee Batchelder um, and come back to the board if, if you all would like that. You certainly have the right to do that. So if I understand the constraints here though, Lee would be able to tell us okay, here are the setbacks, here's you know, your buildable footprint, but the, they would need to go get a variance from BZA in order to you know, achieve the current footprint. It, that's what I got out of somebody's presentation. That, that is correct. And that would be the case on any lot anywhere in, in Harleston yeah. Village that's existing non-conforming. So, so I mean, a question for the board then is that, is what the zoning administrator Lee would be able to tell us actually helpful? I think I think he'd be able to to think through that, even though he doesn't have, have um, a, an actual proposed design in front of him. I think he could kind of render an opinion on the theoretical zoning probability feasibility of rebuilding there in a similar footprint, similar high scale mass. Okay. At least in regarding the city's opinion. If, City would be willing to, you know, entertain that. Yeah, Do you agree, I, Jacob? I, um, so we would have to evaluate the new proposal. We're not going to give you an opinion about that until we know what the new proposal would be. Um, so uh, I, I know I'm, not, I'm probably not being extremely helpful here, um, but I will say this: that the Board of Zoning Appeals is going to look at whatever comes next independently. And those kinds of requests are routinely granted, of course, especially if pre-existing buildings held a similar footprint. So it would not be out of line for the board to grant such a thing. Um, however, they have a public hearing just like this one. I'm sure they would hear from neighbors and it's not a foregone conclusion how the board may render that opinion. I think it's a challenging thing for you all to intertwine the two. And I, I don't wanna lead your decision at all uh, other than the staff comments. Um, I will say that I think your criteria for considering demolition is, uh, is, is fairly clear and you all are to look at the structural qualities of the building and you know, how it contributes to, um, to the history of uh, whether it has an inherent historical value and how it contributes to the city itself. Um, not so much judging what may come next. Uh, I know that may not be always the easiest decision, but um, uh, frankly, I think that the criteria for demolition don't involve the new proposal. And it seems like what we're valuing is its height, scale, mass, and relationship to the streetscape, which we might be hesitant to let go of without any indication of, of whether it'd be feasible to replace that with something new, but similar in nature. 
I, Glenn Gardner, I, I, I think what, what you just said, Julia, is important. And, and Jacob, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. I know it's difficult to, to give an answer, but I think in this case, I mean, in, in part, I feel like it's our job as a board or my job as a board member to in part listen to the public. And, and, and when, you know, I feel like our chair read off letters from nearly every neighbor. Um, I, I don't feel comfortable saying, yes, it should be demolished without having more information from the zoning administrator, at least, uh, especially knowing that, you know, I, I guess we have officially heard that the flood maps will be approved and that would give them a little more, give the, the, the submittal team, the applicant, a little more information, I think, um, in this case, I think they should submit more information and less because I, while, while the structural scenario of this building is not high quality historic structure, it also is not a failing structure, which is what I think a lot of times we review as a board to approve a demolition. So I, I guess I will follow up with a second to Julia's motion that technically is still on the table. Julia, uh, please reiterate your motion. It was, def it was deferral for additional well, information. I'm sorry, go ahead. Check this out, I got a new one. Um, now it, I would recommend, I would make a motion for a deferral for more information regarding the proposed preservation of the streetscape and content. And I think the applicant themselves could look into that and provide something because it's the streetscape and it's the context and it's the height scale mass that we don't want to let go. That I think many of us might not vote to approve that. That's my motion. Okay. And to be clear, so this additional information would come from the zoning administrator? Not necessarily. The applicant could definitely talk to the zoning administrator and should, and that should be vetted, but I think the applicant could, could tackle that as part of reapplying. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll just re read it, and then if there's a second. So, Julie made a motion for deferral uh, to receive more information regarding the proposed preservation of the streetscape and the context. Um, is there a second? Second. Okay, second by Glenn. Um, okay, so I'll put it up for a vote. Is there any other discussion on the motion? No. Um, okay, so I'll call the roll. Bill? Yay, in favor. Uh, Julia? Yay, in favor. Glenn? Yay, in favor. Okay, chair votes, yay, in favor, so the motion passes. All right, so the next agenda item is 106-108 Dunham. Okay, very good, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is agenda item number three, 106-108 Dunham Street, and this is another uh, demolition request of an attached, for an attached carport. Um, this, the, uh, the primary building here is a category four building, therefore the property is rated category four. It's in Wagner Terrace, um, pre-1944. And it, again, is outside your, outside your jurisdiction for new construction, but it's in a historic material um, demolition purview area. So just uh, to orient to the site, um, this is Dunneman. The site is located in between 9th and 8th, uh, just north of the Citadel campus, as you can see here. And the uh, structure in question, as you can, as you see indicated uh, by the arrow here, is attached um, to, to this existing building. Here it is highlighted again. Um, these are historic images here, uh, 2003, and uh, that is the entirety of our of our orientation. So, uh, with that said, I will turn it over to the applicant um, for presentation. Give me just a second to find them. Don't see them here. Oh, here we go. We have Reed Green, who's now a panelist, 
and can unmute and turn on the camera. Unmute. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Can you see me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I cannot see myself, so. Um, thank you for having us here, um, or, or me here, actually. I am here making this presentation on behalf of my client, uh, Mary Shade, who is the, has been the owner of this property since 1988. Um, they bought, she bought the property, uh, well, she brought she bought lot seven and lot eight. That's 106 and 108 Dunham and Avenue. At, um, at the same time, and those when she bought them. Well, let me step back. She bought those two at the same time in 1988, and the uh, the property at the time had and still does these both of both what I think was originally a garage apartment, a garage um, on lot seven, which is 106 Dunneman, and then a, a dwelling on lot eight, 108 Dunneman. Lot eight's um, carport encroaches, as you saw, onto lot six, almost in its entirety. There is a um, brick landing a brick with stairs to go into the house and enter the house from the side that does not encroach the property line comes up almost just to that um, but the carport does encroach they've rented these houses out for for all this time and um, are now actually have listed the property on the market to be sold um, but it is not very marketable with two dwellings on it. This um, lot seven has, um, is now a, a single fa family dwelling as well as lot eight and we cannot, it's not marketable with the carport encroaching that causes title issues um, and it is not marketable for two dwellings on, on this one pro on to be sold on one property altogether. Um, the uh, the client, my clients are proposing to remove that um, that carport and to replace any um, to replace the siding where the carport would be detached with the legal replacement for that asbestos siding that is that is on the property now, um, and then also tie back in the roof. Um, as it comes down and out where the um, carport roof attaches, tie that back in. Those are just wooden fascia boards, I believe. Um, tie that back in that way so that it, it you know, you, there's no, it's a seamless transition. Um, these two properties are completely separate now. Um, and I think they always have been. If you look at the original plat from uh, 1918, they were separate properties, and I can only assume, without doing extensive title work, that at one point they were owned by the same owner who built these structures this way. Um, however, they did build the garage in the rear of Lot 7, uh, right up against the property line, and the actual dwelling unit on lot eight right up against the property line. The only encroachment is that um, that carport. So they're, they are completely separate. They have separate water, separate electricity, separate TMS numbers, separate tax map number, um, that is tax map number, separate taxes to be paid. Um, and in order to, to be able to market these properties and in order to be able to sell them, um, they, and my clients would like to request to remove that carport. Okay, thank you, Reed. Um, is there any board questions right now? All right, we'll um, a question for uh, staff. Were there any um, slides or display of some of these site conditions that we can look at in the presentation? Uh, being, being site plans or surveys or anything like that. Right. 
I'm just going through the applicant's presentation yes, here. Um, so if you, um, Ms. Green, if you want to uh, direct me here, I'm happy to. So that, this is the entirety of the presentation. So here's. Uh, yeah. Um, I only got involved earlier this week, so I apologize. We did, We actually don't have um, any construction plans or any drawings from from you know any architects or anything to that degree right now, um, because all we want to do is remove it, and it should not affect the structural integrity in any way of the house. I, I also don't believe it and affects the historical nature of the home itself either as it's just the attached carport um, but it, it, as you can see the on this slide that you have up right now um, the carport goes completely over um, the uh, the property line there in the middle and if you'll go back a couple to, uh, well so this is the um, Okay, so you can see here the landing, the landing, that brick landing on these stairs, where these stairs are, that the edge of that is basically right up to the property line. So when they built these houses, they obviously knew because of the way that if you look at how they are built right there on that, um, that newer plat, you can see they built right up to the property lines, um, knowing that it was two separate lots and knowing that they were encroaching over um on to lot seven with that the sandborn map doesn't show it as two separate lots and i i don't understand that um they do sh you know but if you look at the 19 like i said the 1918 plat it does show it and i don't think you have that in yours this is one that was this is a survey that was done for my client um, in anticipation of her purchasing it in the in 1988 so Okay, any other questions right now? All right, uh, we'll go to public comment. We have one speaker and we'll go to April Wood. Thank you. Um, April Wood, Historic Charleston Foundation. HCF has reviewed the request for demolition of the attached carport at 106 to 108 Deniman Street and reviewing the historic Sandmore Sandborn maps and plats, it appears that this carport is original to the house. The Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation state that the historic character of a property shall be retained and preserved. The removal of historic materials that could characterize a property shall be avoided. Rather than pursue demolition, we recommend pursuing a property line adjustment. This application does not meet the Secretary of the Interior Standards, and we recommend denial of the request for demolition of the carport. Thank you. Okay, Alex, no more public comments? No other public comment. Okay, so staff recommendation. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, go to the staff recommendation. Um, for 106, 108 down the street, a um, couple of top comments. Uh, the first is that the carport brick piers have the same extruded brick that exists on the foundation of the house. And because of this, we can assume that the carport is either original or constructed shortly thereafter. Um, second, the carport has elements that depict its age, such as tapered columns, beadboard ceiling, period light fixture, and exposed rafter tails. And the third is that the unique element is an example of Charleston's vernacular architecture and should be retained. The staff recommendation is for the denial of demolition per staff comments. Okay. Uh, Ms. Green, do you want to uh, respond to public comment or clarify anything with staff comments, et cetera? Uh, my, only, my only rebuttal to the public comment would be that if, that it, I don't believe that it would be feasible to do a property line adjustment considering the structure on the neighboring property takes up the full width of that property unless you are cutting out i just don't think that that is a feasible a feasible um and just looking at that plot there i don't believe it's a feasible uh remedy um that's my rebuttal to that okay so we'll go to, thank you, we'll, we'll go to uh, board discussion. Um, 
Fillmore, I skipped you on, on the last one. Could you um, kick us off, start us off in terms of board discussion on this? Yes, Fillmore Wilson. Uh, very quickly, um, I agree with staff. Uh, all of the evidence indicates that the carport is contemporaneous with the structure and is a contributing architectural feature. And so I would not be in favor of demolition. I agree. This is Julia. Um, I mean, it's really clear that whoever built this house had a double lot and kind of set it forever to be a double lot. And I guess that's, you know, how it was purchased by your client. And for better or worse, that's kind of what it is. Um, and the carport is integral. I know it's a minor element by some um, metrics, but it's integral to, to the house. Um, this is Bill Huey. I, I agree with the previous comments from Julia and Phil Moore. Um, and I do agree with the comments from, from HCF uh, about the potential uh, realigning of the property line, probably immediately to the north side of the carport, jog over to clear the carport and then work back to the street. Still leave some frontage for the existing neighboring house as well. But that's not our purview, just simply to support, uh, I, I believe, the evidence of the age of the structure, as Phil Moore stated, being uh, original with the house uh, is, is that major factor of, of my thought. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jay, no, I, I think there's some extraordinary site conditions here, but I think staff focused in on the right uh, criteria, which are, you know, the contributing of this sort of accessory structure to the house and how it contributes to the neighborhood uh, and its architectural features. So I, I think they uh, looked at the right things and, um, you know, despite the circumstances, I, I, I think that's the right, the right call on it. So I agree with staff as well. Is there, is anybody got any other discussion or is there um, a motion floating out there? I'll make a motion uh, for uh, denial of demolition per staff comments. Second. All right. So, Bill Moore's made a motion. Julia has seconded it. A uh, motion for denial of demolition per staff comments. Um, I'll call the roll. Uh, Bill? Yay, in favor. Phil Moore? Yay, in favor. Julia? Yay, in favor. Glenn? Yay, in favor. Chair votes, yay, in favor. Um, so the motion passes unanimously. Um, okay, the next agenda item is 8183 Cannon Street. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I refer 8183 Cannon Street. This is a request for final approval uh, to disassemble and reassemble 83 Cannon um, due to structural instability, a uh, somewhat unusual type of request in front of, of the board. This is a category four rated building. It's in Canterbury, Elliot Borough. Uh, pre-1872 in the Olden Historic District. And just to orient you to the location, this is the corner of Smith and Cannon Streets, um, a prominent building that many of you probably know, um, having been in this condition for quite some time. Um, it has the, the now amazing sign, which has been on it for as long as I've been in Charleston, I think. So you, you all know this building. This is looking uh, back down Cannon Street in the old days prior to its two-way conversion, looking the other direction on Cannon Street. In this case, the building is directly behind you and to your right. And just uh, a couple of the, the previous, um, looking at the history of the survey cards, previous uses, this is a building that has always had a shop front ground level um, and it's had residences uh, above it and is, is um, in its restored state will function in a very similar way, uh, we believe. So with that said, um, with that introduction, I'll turn it over to the applicant for presentation. All right, we should have Laura Altman and Mark Riddlebuto should be both panelists and can unmute themselves. Okay, I am here. My name is Laura Altman, LFA Architecture. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I want to first thank the staff and board members and um, Preservation Society for the taking your time to come over to the building today for the site meeting. And um, Mr. Lindsay, if you'll pull up my presentation, just to the first slide, please. 
keep going through. Keep there going. Thank you. On this. Yeah, there, it should come up to just one big picture of the front of the building. Okay, I'll just keep going through and just tell me when to stop. So, Well, you're going to see here all the slides that were submitted to us, which go directly into that presentation. Okay, I had sent a specific PowerPoint. Um, so that okay. is that is not in use. What we have are the slides that uh, is the the entirety of these slides. Um, if you like, uh, we could try to grab that PowerPoint if we have that uh, on hand. How do we do that, Alex? Do you have that? Yeah. If not, I can talk. But it had just a little bit better graphics for talking through this. So, Jacob, we should have that saved in that folder under under the address. Um, and it looks like it's the only PowerPoint PowerPoint in that folder. If you can open and share that. Okay. Very good. Um, thank you. So, if you if you all will just bear with me for one moment. I will um, attempt to bring that up. Okay. Okay, Ms. Altman, apologies for the delay. I am going no problem. to. Um, switch over to your PowerPoint. So I'm going to um, stop my share and then I will come back on with a screen share of the PowerPoint as it comes up. Okay, thank you for bearing with us. These things do take a moment as we go through our technology. Okay, so you be seeing your PowerPoint here, and I'm going to leave it in this mode rather than going to full screen if that's okay for you. That's fine. Okay. Um, thank you so much for doing that. Um, of course. Okay, this project is at the corner of Smith and Cannon um, and has the historic corner store entry with. Um, so commercial on the ground floor, residential at the top floor. We received full BAR approval um, from staff back in May. Um, and as we got under construction, if you'll go to the next slide, we started um, preparing for construction, stabilizing number 81, which is at the corner of Smith and Cannon, and realized through that process that there was very little to stabilize and very little historic fabric remaining at number 83, which is at the western portion of the building, kind of behind the crepe myrtle trees there in the picture. So I'm going to go through kind of from the ground up to talk about the different pieces and parts of the building. You'll go to the next slide. Uh, you'll see that those concrete slabs throughout the building were poured right on top of the wood floors right on top of the wood framing and all, and those go up to the interior faces of the wall, interior, interior faces of the exterior walls. Um, we had already planned to remove those slabs um, and um, support the building so that we could put in new foundations and footings, um, and that was already previously approved. So that will all come out um, in tr terms of flooring. You'll go to the next slide, please. The north wall of the building along Cannon Street, highlighted with that the little dash line, the um, orange area in general, that is the portion of the building we're talking about that's number 83 Cannon. The north wall was at the first floor originally planned for removal previously because that's where we were taking out the brick um, columns and doing the new storefront of the office and then bringing that wood siding all the way down to the sidewalk. Um, in addition to that, of course, the space above the first floor, half of that portion of the building is already gone. And then there is a small portion that we would be removing that hadn't previously been planned for demolition, 
and we would be salvaging as much of that siding as we can. Next slide, please. The east wall at the first floor had also already been planned for demolition because that portion was being removed to open up the whole first floor as the commercial space. Um, in the process of doing all this and looking even closer, we realized all of that wood um, on those walls are treated wood, modern studs, modern siding, even with little barcodes still on them. Um, then we go to the east wall. The next slide, please. Yes. Um, this wall, we had, we, this wall has a lot of deteriorated siding, as you can see here, and we saw on site today, just due to termites and plant growth and just general lack of maintenance. Uh, we had already planned to take this siding off as part of our previous approval in order to add plywood for structural stability and a tighter envelope and then reapply siding. So this um, is still in keeping with that previous uh, proposal, except that we did realize all of the studs in this area are newer modern studs. You can tell that they're, some of them are treated wood, but they're all um, in bad shape and only really being held up by the plywood at the interior, which was added after the last hurricane in order to stabilize this building. Uh, okay, next, that was the west wall. This is the south wall. And again, similar situation here with very much deteriorated siding. We will save as much of that siding as we can to reuse. And we, at the interior, we have modern treated wood studs. Then at the next slide, we have the second floor. And here you're looking at some of that second floor flooring material, but you're also seeing all of the damage done by the two fires that took place over the years. And these members are far beyond just charring. And so no matter what we do to encapsulate them, that smell will be there forever. And so we do not recommend keeping these, salvaging them or sistering them because of that odor. Next slide, please. You'll also see in this slide and in our next slide that large portions of the building are already missing anyway. Um, and so the demolition, the taking apart, there's just not all that much there. Next slide, please. This is the rear of the building at the southeast corner where a whole chunk of the building is gone. And then if you'll go to the, the next slide, I think, yes. We do have material we want to salvage. At the interior, um, in the main portion of that original uh, building at 83, there are about 15 or so uh, wood floor joists that can be salvaged and reused in some manner. They are too short because they are rotten at the ends. They're too short to use in their existing locations, but we can salvage those. The flooring on the, that was there um, on those floor joists has already been salvaged and stored. At the interior, um, also right, running right down the middle of 83, are nine wall studs that are those heavy timbers that will be saved. As I mentioned, we'll save as much siding as we can to be reused. And then the turn metal at the roof, we will save um, what is reusable, salvaging that to then hopefully use it at, in my um, preference first on number 81, because at 81, that roof is much more intact. We can use the um, additional salvage material and try to maintain that whole roof as being turned metal and then see what we have left for the rest to be reused on 83. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. This is just uh, that perspective view of what we had proposed previously. The proposed elevations, floor plans, none of that is changing. So our proposed design remains as is, as was approved um, by staff and by this board previously. Thank you for your time. Thanks for putting up my, my slides for me. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer those. You're on mute, Jay. Any questions? Thank you. Nope. Okay, we'll go to uh, Alex. Let's go to public comment then. Have Erin Minigan. Let me find her. All right. Thank you, 
Erin Minigan, Preservation Society of Charleston. We would like to first thank the applicant for reaching out to us on this project and appreciate the opportunity to visit the site this morning. While it's incredibly unfortunate the building has deteriorated to a point where it's unable to be rehabilitated in place, we are glad for the efforts to carefully disassemble and reassemble the structure. To ensure historic material is reused to the greatest extent possible, we would encourage the board to require greater specificity in the final drawing submitted to staff to identify the materials able to be salvaged and reincorporated. Thank you. Okay, so I, I'm gonna check with April Wood because I had her down as a maybe for speaking and I'm just gonna allow her to speak and let her clarify if she has uh, any comments. Uh, April Wood, Historic Charleston Foundation. We have spoken to the applicant and gone through this um, project virtually, and we are in support of the, the application. Thank you. Uh, Alex, how about um, staff comments and recommendation? Great. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will go to those. What I'm going to do here is just restart my share so I can bring up that slide. So if you bear with me for just one moment, we will do that. Okay. There we go. Thank you all for bearing with me. So you should be viewing the PDF once again. I'm going to go to the end of that. Okay, thank you. All right, um, 8183 Cannon Street, uh, staff comments. Our first, the structure suffered a great fire in addition to the deferred maintenance, as you've seen. Um, number two, there's minimal material to preserve in C2 due to, due to severe charring of the framing. Number three, um, the floor system and historic exterior siding on the north elevation should be salvaged. Number four, the applicant should submit a preservation plan documenting the elements to be retained in elevation and in plan drawings for final review by staff. And the staff recommendation is for approval uh, with the comments as noted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Laura, would you like to respond to public comment or staff comments, recommendations? I will, I have some of that information added on those floor plans. I will add that to the exterior elevations to make more clear notes in terms of what will be salvaged exactly. Um, but okay. if you need to refer back to the drawings um, in this, presentation part that you're already in, um, the demolition drawings D101 to 103 have um, notes about what will be saved in the plan format at least. Okay, thank you. So now we are in um, board discussion. Um, I think Glenn, would you mind kicking us off on this one? Sure. Um, I had another look at this from the street. Obviously, I, I did not go in on my own because um, initially when it was submitted, I was a little confused since we'd already looked at it not that long ago. But I think I understand why it's here and I, I think I can support it. Um, I know I'm saying I think not 100%, but I, I just wish there was a way to avoid full demolition of it. But um, I've heard the application and I understand it. Okay. This is Julia. I, I agree with staff and I think this move seems reasonable at this point, even though it is a regrettable consequence of extensive demolition by neglect, not by the applicant, but by someone. Um, this is Bill. I agree with uh, staff's comments and recommendation. I'll just make a motion, if I may, for um, approval with staff comments noted. Okay. Is there a second? This is Bill. I will second. All right. I'll put, I will put it to a vote. Um, Bill? Yay. In favor? Fillmore? Yay. In favor? Julia? Yay in favor. Glenn? Yay in favor. All right, Chair Vince, yay in favor. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, okay, next agenda item is 34 Savage. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is item number five, 34 Savage Street. Um, this is a request for conceptual approval for alteration and addition to connect non-historic dependency to the house. Um, the main structure is a category three. It's in Charlestown neighborhood pre-1902, and it is in the old and historic district. For orientation, you can see here it is on the south side of Savage Street, the diagonal street connecting Broad to Rutledge, and just a few a uh, few images of the existing site conditions. Just from the other side, looking down, uh, looking northeast on Savage, and then in the opposite direction, southwest. This is the 1973 image of the house. And with that uh, brief orientation, I'll turn it over to the applicant. All right, we should have um, three applicant speakers who are now panelists. All right, thank you, Alex. I think you have me to give the presentation. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Becky, yeah. oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay, the board. Uh, I'm Becky Fenno. I'm here with my associate, Jen Fei Shen, and the uh, client, Gary Gildersleeve, is online as well, and he would like to speak following my presentation. Uh, if you could go to the first slide, please. Uh, this is 34 Savage Street. Um, we are proposing a um, sort of modest second story addition to a rear dependency. And I want to say that we, we really spent a lot of time and effort in um, basically December and January speaking to neighbors and really coming up with a solution that was amenable to everybody. And, uh, and at that point we went to Board of Zoning and were hit the COVID delay until uh, June, which is when we received our uh, zoning approval. Uh, so we are very thankful to be here. Um, if you move forward, please. Uh, these are just the Sanborns. I won't go over them except to say that uh, after 1955, part of the rear piazza was enclosed and then the one story, uh, dependency that's shown on the plan is not is not historic and we have received the appropriate partial demolition for that that's uh, needed for the project. If you go forward please and you can go forward again. These are the photos uh, similar to what Mr. Lindsay just showed on the left uh, 34 Savage from the street then the piazza then a uh, third is the rear elevation. And actually at the far right is one of the most important photos for our proposal because it is the visibility or it is what the visibility is of the rear dependency as seen up the driveway on the north side uh, at 36 Savage. If you go to the next slide, this is the dependency at the back. It's a small, CMU building, but the east side, which is on the top right, that east wall frames the garden at 17 New Street. This is the view from their garden. We've spoken with them a number of times and have agreed to preserve that wall for them, uh, as well as the wall on the bottom left facing the property at 36 Savage Street. So that was an agreement that was sort of developed during the planning process. And then on the bottom right, you can see the, the gap between the main house on the left and the dependency where we propose a hyphen. If you go to the next slide, uh, and this is the plat. We can go to the next slide. This actually, I won't go through this in detail. We did this in uh, January where we really studied the neighborhood to see whether the density was appropriate. And uh, we, we realized that it was, and this uh, zoning agreed with us and granted the zoning approval for the project. You can go forward, I think to A100, which is the site plan. So this is the site plan showing the rear dependency. The, at the, on the top, the existing plan, we've highlighted the walls that will be removed. And a hyphen, uh, you can see on the bottom, the proposed site, 
site plan where we propose a hyphen attaching the two buildings and leveling the floor level of the dependency, that first floor. And then the hatch area is actually the footprint of the second floor because it does not sit directly on the first floor. It slides away from the neighbor to the north and away from the neighbor to the east. We'll see that in just a minute. You can go to the next slide. This is the first floor where we can see in a little bit more detail uh, what I just spoke about in terms of the scope of the project. I will say that the parts that are visible on the south side of the building from Savage Street are the entrance. We're requesting a new entrance doorway to the kitchen with a transom and we're requesting a change in the window at the far right of the main house. And then you can see the similar configuration I just spoke about with the hyphen, with the elevator and uh, passageway to the dependency. And then that the new mudroom and space that will be developed in the dependency. And it's been agreed. We've also had an arborist look at the magnolia tree and that it's, it's in agreed that that will be preserved and um, that they feel that that will, that will be able to thrive during the project. If you go to the next slide, please. So this is the second floor and really what's visible of the addition is maybe the far right portion of the second floor. We have, uh, with response to the neighbors, we have left the first floor volume or part of it kind of wrapping around the second floor. You can see that roof structure below and we have shifted the second floor to the south and to the west in order to step back from those neighbors and from their property line. If you go to the next, oh, actually, can you go back one? There was another, I just wanted to note that there is a step down into the office and exercise room. That is our, um, we've also made all efforts to make the scale of this addition as small as possible, as low in height as possible. Next slide, please. This is the roof plan, uh, the existing at the top and the new below. And you can see the sequence of pieces that we now have with the hyphen, with the HVAC units on it and the upper roof of the second floor. And then that lower roof where we'll keep the same form of the dependency down on the first floor. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the west elevation on Savage Street will have no change. Next slide. The south elevation, the only things that are visible from Savage Street will be on the main house. So at the far right of the piazza, we're requesting a change in that kitchen door to something that's more appropriate, a divided light door with a transom above. And then on the bank of windows to the right of that, we're requesting the removal of the non-historic circular window with a double hung window that mirrors the uh, window on the far left of that bank. And then and you can, in elevation, though we don't see it from the street, you can see our configuration for the uh, proposed addition with the elevator as a hyphen, that sort of vertical uh, hyphen piece, and then the gable roof of the new second floor over the addition. And then so the whole composition steps down from the main house going back toward New Street and concludes with the one story piece of the dependency that remains. Next slide, please. This is the north elevation. Uh, it, in reality, I, I feel like with vegetation, it will not be visible, but we cannot argue that. So the far left of the addition, uh, second floor addition will probably be visible if there were no vegetation. Uh, from the main house, again, you can see our hyphen, which has an elevator in it. We've kept that as low as possible. So it does, it is subordinate. It comes in under the eave of the main building. It's back three feet from the property line, which is two feet from the face of the main house wall. 
then the uh, wall of the addition is flush with that, but we have a vertical trim piece there to define the two volumes. And then you can see the remainder of the dependency that is at the first level. There's really mature vine on the north side and on the east side. So again, we have, we have worked with the neighbors to agree to keep that. Uh, next slide, please. This is the east elevation as seen from, which will only be seen from 17 New Street. Uh, again, you can see the massing stepping up from the original gable wall covered, covered with vine to the new gabled wall, where we're adding just a cased opening with shutters to add a little bit of detail to the neighbor's view, basically. Next slide, please. This is the section, just so we could show how we've really worked and made a great effort to reduce the, the height of this new space. Uh, the, even though we brought the floor level of the dependency up to the same floor level as the house, it has a lower ceiling height. And then that ceiling height on the second floor is also very modest. And we step down from the main house. Next slide, please. Sorry about that. I don't know if you guys what happened there with my screen share. I apologize. So. Sorry if uh, do I still have everyone? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I've lost my my uh, I have a slight tech issue here. I've lost visibility of my um of my screen. That's interesting. Um so for here we go. Okay, bring back how about this? Are we back? Can you guys see me? And can you see my screen share? That's a yes. yes. Yeah. Running multiple monitors here. <laughs> so apologies. Okay, let's see if we can get to your next slide. How about that? No problem. We're, we're down to the last two. The right just shows a perspective so that you can better understand the, the, uh, the volumes of the uh, elevator hyphen and then that second floor addition. And then if you go to the next slide, the last slide, this shows the current view on the left, uh, and this is the visibility of the addition, which would be up the driveway at 36 Savage Street. And we honestly feel like it's not going to be visible, but the, the computer, and when we look at it three-dimensionally, it does show that some portion of that second story wall will be, could potentially be seen if there were no vegetation. Uh, Thank you. I do know that Gary Gildersleeve would like to speak, Alex, if that's possible. Yes, I'll, he can just unmute himself and should yep. be able to speak. Hi, um, thank you for letting me speak. I won't take more than a second, um, but I'm Gary Gildersleeve and um, I have just retired. My wife and I are moving to uh, South Carolina, specifically Charleston at the end of this month. Uh, really, probably all I need to say is that we were attracted to Charleston due to the history, culture, and architecture. And uh, we wouldn't do anything to hurt the architectural or historical part of this building. In fact, what I think uh, excites us about making this change is that we're going from a cinder block, which cinder block shed, which really doesn't belong to the building. And we're going to be replacing it with something that is going to look uh, just like the uh, initial original building. So um, that's really all I, have to, all I have to say. But, um, you know, we understand what your job is. And uh, we are hoping that what we are proposing is, is in line and uh, will be accepted. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Becky. Um, does any board member have any questions right now? Oh, I just wondered if um, the applicant could let us know what zoning approvals were sought and granted. Uh, the uh, zoning approval has been granted uh, for the for the full scope of work. And then the demolition 
has been approved by BAR, the partial demolition has been approved because- I just wondered like the specific zoning request. Uh, the uh, specific zoning or request was for, um, I might need to pull that. That was for definitely for some additional lot coverage and for the variance for the, uh, the uh, rear setback. Okay, thank you. Bill Moore here. Becky, quick question. Um, on A901, uh, the right hand uh, perspective. Yes. Uh, that kind of unusual configuration with the setback um, uh, create, creates apparently a little well that's about three feet by <laughs> three feet. It, the own, it's the only access for maintenance to those areas over the neighbor, over from the neighbor's driveway into that little space. Uh, so that, actually, that little space is owned by us. Uh, yes. And we basically will have to figure out how to not make that uh, just a, uh, a trap for water. Basically, we'll probably have a sump pump in there and drainage running to our side. That may actually be a good opportunity spot for us to bring down a downspout and actually then go under the building to our side to take the water across. So that little void is actually part of our property, uh, but we're leaving the site wall for the neighbor. That's one of those little spots that, that disappears when maintenance is done. That's yeah. <laughs> my only. That's a tough thing to maintain. Yeah. Got any other questions right now? No. Okay. Uh, Alex, let's go to public comment then. We have Aaron Minigan. Thank you. Erin Megan, Preservation Society of Charleston. Uh, we appreciate the applicant reaching out to us on this project. And first would like to applaud the architect and the owner for their art outreach efforts in the neighborhood. Overall, we are struggling with the complicated nature of this design. This house has been subject to some unfortunate alterations over the years, and there are already multiple masses and roof lines in play. We are not opposed to a two-story addition, but would like to see an approach that makes the overall design of the rear of the building more cohesive. Given the dependency is non-historic, we feel it would be better to start with a clean slate to design something simpler and more straightforward. Specifically, the proposal to build the addition on top of the existing one-story footprint creates an awkward condition in which the second floor cantilevers out over the existing building and creates a third competing roof line we would ask for deferral for further study of this approach. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Alex, if there's no other public comment, we'll go to staff comments and recommendations. No other public comment. Okay, uh, on to the staff recommendations. Um, Wait, Alex? Of the street. Um, these are our staff comments. And uh, first of all, uh, the VAR staff approved a partial demolition, as was mentioned before, of the dependency CME walls and the 5B metal roof as no historic materials present. Um, the existing building is not the same one that appears on the Sanborn maps. That's been clarified already. Um, number two, the applicant has successfully demonstrated that many houses in the area have one and two-story rear additions, many of which are on or very near the lot line. The third is that the proposed second floor addition appears to be inset to conform to the required three-foot setback for new construction, and that was also discussed. Um, the fourth is that the proposed second floor addition is inappropriate and we think it should be restudied to align with the first floor footprint along the property line and utilize a hyphen. And the fifth is that if required by zoning, a variant should be pursued to allow for a more appropriate vertical addition rather than the imposed design, which we do feel um, similar to the Preservation Society is somewhat awkward in its roof line alignments. And number six, uh, the roof pitch of the addition should match the main house if possible, and this can be uh, this can be done uh, and still be subordinate. This will also allow windows to be lowered uh, from the eaves. So the staff recommendation is for deferral for restudy uh, with the staff comments. Okay. Jacob, before we go forward, Becky just reminded me that she had submitted some, um, some letters that I failed to get um, to the chair. Um, so those need to be read into the record as well. I can either send those to Jay now, or I can read them if you prefer. I defer to the chair. Mr. Chair, would you like to read can those you, in the record? 
can you just flip me a um, an email real quick? Yeah, yes, I will send them to you right now. Mr. Chairman, in the meantime, yep. am I out of order in asking the applicant one question in light of staff's comments and public comment, or should I just wait? Uh, to what, Alex, are you teed up, or is it going to take a sec? They should be on their way right now. Okay, I don't, Bill, let me just read them real quick so we just stay in order. I don't think it'll save us any time to get into questions. All right, I got them right here. So, a letter from... Um, Sarah Goulden, who writes that, uh, who, at 32 Savage, who writes that Jay and I met with Becky Fenno on January 8, 2020, in regards to uh, the Gildersleeves project at 34 Savage, based on what she said about the future project, we're in agreement with her plan. Uh, and then it looks like a series, perhaps the same letter, but the letter is that uh, I've had an opportunity to review the Gildersleeves plans to renovate their house at 34 Savage and have no objections and that's signed by uh, Peter Manny, Annette Manny at 17 New, which I guess is an adjacent neighbor in the rear, uh, by Richard and Elizabeth Rubin at 15 New. Um, another letter, my name is Robert Habig, residing at 16 Savage, several houses down. I'm familiar with the building lot, neighbors, the architect, the owners, who reviewed, discussed the plans. I strongly support this application for the plan renovation. The city, more specifically the BAR, should applaud and support full-time residents like the Gildersleeves who have the commitment and resources to maintain and enhance their properties in an historically sensitive manner, properties that are key to the city's character, tourism-based economy. I'd be happy to provide additional perspective endorsement if desired. Uh, Robert Hamig at 16 Savage. Um, so those are the letters that we received. Um, Becky, would you like to respond to public comment and staff comments or clarify anything? Uh, I'd like to respond that actually we worked very hard. This is actually, we did do many studies uh, of kind of cleanly building on top of the uh, dependency, but really we're, Gary and Carolyn were just very focused on being good neighbors and wanted to come up with a design that really responded to their requests and to the views from their uh, their yards. So that was just a very important part of the design, really. And uh, we feel like we came up with something that was a good balance and, and is really going to be very, very minimally visible from the public way. Okay. Thank you. So um, let's go to board discussion. Um, Bill, I think we're back around to you, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off here. Um, thank you. Uh, the the question I had, I just wanted to see if I could get that addressed real quick. Um, sure. uh, if you could go back maybe to one of the perspective slides or something like that, one Fillmore pointed out would be great. Uh, yeah, that one. Well, no, no, no. no. I'll, I'll slow yeah. down here and you can direct me. Uh, uh, towards the end. Towards the end. Towards the end. There, just leave it right there. Ah. Right here, okay. Right there. No. Um, I just wanted to clarify. So, um, Becky, you had mentioned that you had gone to zoning and um, you had gotten relief, I believe you said, for lot coverage, and then you mentioned setback. Can yes. you tell us which setback was germane to that review? Was that the rear setback? And it's the rear setback uh, where the building is on the property line. It, the gabled end is on the property line, but we set back, but it has a 25 foot setback, which, you know, nothing, nothing would, would, uh, would adhere to that on even the existing project at the moment. And I guess I'm noting this uh, lettering on this drawing says wall <laughs> setback. So that would be the north wall is set to the setback. Um, for that purpose, is that why the wall was located at that area right there? It was because yeah. of this setback? Yes. Okay. Um, I guess I would say in, in, in light of the comments that have been made, I, I do agree with, um, with um, several of the comments that have been made um, about the form of the structure. I do applaud the applicant's efforts. Um, and um, 
I guess I would just make one more statement. Obviously, what uh, more the, to staff's recommendation would involve an additional zoning activity and an assumption that um, I guess that would be a of a non-conforming use, um, probably a special exception of some kind. Um, I would just say that uh, I did witness a zoning meeting here very recently where um, an effort was made to do something similar and with petition against that from the neighbors and the applicant was actually told by zoning to push the wall back up onto the roof um, to adhere to the setback. So um, I guess we don't know anything for sure. Uh, I do agree that the form would be cleaner, obviously, if it was just a simple continuation of what was currently going on. Um, um, so I'm a bit torn in, in what I'm seeing because I do appreciate the efforts the applicants made. I just, um, I didn't know if, if potentially uh, a version which the applicants stated that they investigated a cleaner version being just a direct extension over the existing footprint had been passed by the zoning administrator for any initial sort of staff comment or feedback. Um, I'd be interested to know that. Um, but in theory, yes, I do agree with the comments made by staff and the Preservation Society for those reasons. It's just these extenuating issues that are having me a bit torn. Um, this is Julia, and I'll just segue from that. I basically feel the same way you do, Bill. Objectively, as a design, it seems rather forced and convoluted, but um, I really understand that the applicant's been through the minefield of neighbor concerns and dynamics as well as zoning technicalities already. And so I think ultimately my acceptance of this is, is mitigated because it's very minimally, if at all, visible and, and that affects our purview. So that kind of calculating, I'm calculating that into my assessment. I, I think that, you know, aside from the improvement to the piazza door and the improvement to that round window, the impact on the public right of way of what's proposed here is really minimal, if, if anything. And because of all the other issues that she's had to overcome, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. Any other board member have any comments to share before we start trying to come up with a motion? Um, okay, so who, let's see here. Is there a motion, Julia or Bill, that you would be willing to, to put out? Um, I'll make a motion for for, um, I'm gonna make a motion for conceptual approval. Okay, conceptual approval last the minute is the motion. Yeah, okay. Is there a second to Julie's motion? All right. Um, let's see here. Let's let's put it back. I don't, it doesn't have come. It doesn't have a second. Bill or anybody else? Is there a competing motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. This is Bill Huey. I, I would make a motion for deferral or restudy with staff's comments. In particular, staff's comment um, number five. Um, and I would um, also. I can't make it a condition, but I believe the applicant would do it out of just a course of, of action, um, potentially uh, verifying with the zoning administrator prior to um, said uh, process and also with the immediate north neighbor. Um, but uh, the motion would I would make would be for deferral uh, for restudy with staff comments. Okay, and the rest will treat as commentary. Um, 
Okay, so Bill's made a motion for deferral for restudy with staff comments. Is there a second to Bill's motion? Um, Fillmore Wilson here. Um, I will second that. Okay, is there any discussion? Uh, Bill, uh, Bill's made a motion, Fillmore seconded. Is there any discussion of the motion? All right, I'll, I'll put it up to a vote. Um, Bill. Yay in favor. Fillmore. Yay in favor. Julia. Nay opposed. Glenn. Yay in favor. All right, the chair votes yay in favor. Uh, motion carries four to one. <clears throat> All right, next agenda item is 21 Lambo. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So getting to our slides here. Okay, this is agenda item number six. Um, 21 Lambo Street, and this is a request for final approval for renovation to include the new piazza screen, a reopening of the first floor piazza, modification of the existing piazza enclosure, removal of the non-original bay windows and other modifications to the circa 1970, 1987 elements. Um, this is a category three structure. It's in Charlestown neighborhood pre-1902 and it's in the old and historic district. Just quick orientation. This is, uh, you can see the um, building question here, Lamble Street between Legree and King, South Side, and just a few images of the existing site. Um, looking at the context, you can see Lamble here looking toward the, toward, um, toward the west and then Lamble here looking toward the east in the 1973 survey card of the structure, which has a lot fewer trees than you'll find in this neighborhood these days. So uh, with that, I will move on to the applicant's presentation. All right, I have promoted Eddie Fava to panelist and he can unmute himself and turn on the camera if he has it. And camera. Whoops, sorry, there we go. Thank you, good evening. Alex and, and uh, Jacob, sorry, do I share my screen or do y'all do go through or do I have the option to do that? So, uh, this is set up where um, I am the screen sharer, so. Um, Lucky you, uh, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a real privilege, really. Um, among, among the many privileges of my job. Um, I'm sure. Okay. And uh, what I have here is a slideshow that Perfect. was Submitted to our staff, and what you can do is just give me directions, to the next slide, and um, I'll be happy to go to whichever one you. Prefer. Excellent. All right, not not a problem. Thank you all very much for for uh, hearing this application this evening. Um, I am Eddie Faber with PE Faber Architects, representing Jonathan and Ashley Diorio, and their their three young boys who will make this their their permanent home. They are very excited to do so. Have, have spent a lot of time coming to this point. Like like many, I know you were seeing are kind of a victim of the. COVID delay, we started in January and, and, and worked very closely with the Stuart Charleston Foundation and, and thanks in advance to April especially who worked with us on this. Um, and we're ready to go a little after March, but but again, uh, here we are. So we, we are going for final, but in light of everything that is uh, uh, going on and the lack of objections, I, I, I think you'll, you'll agree. Um, that said, next slide. Thank you, Jacob. Um, so uh, the property is, is on Lambeau Street. It's, it's a deep lot. Um, as, as, as you see here. Um, next slide, please. Um, again, it was, was originally built in 1830s, um, but as you'll see in that little synopsis, um, significant kind of renovations were done in the 50s, in the late 80s, um, and then HCF uh, acquired an easement, I think, in an effort to maybe, uh, you know, uh, stop that or maintain it. Um, and at that time, there were also major interior renovations that kind of uh, uh, bond molded up a little bit, but that's what we're here to, to I hope, uh, uh, improve upon. Next slide. Um, for the sand, per the Sanborn maps there, you can see from the 1902, the 1944, the 1951, there's a progression of where there was a detached two-story dependency. Um, the house was a typical single house with a wraparound porch that had a, a, a second building addition to it that had already been filled in at the hyphen, and then that progressed to uh, the 1951 Sanborn, where you, you still had some differentiation of the porch and the setback from the main house um, up until the 80s. Next slide, please. Um, so what, what had happened then, and the, the, the following slide will dictate even better, but 
uh, that, that not only was the, the, the uh, front piazza and built on first and second level, bays had been added, it, it had kind of been chopped up a good bit, and then what you wound up with this train effect with no differentiation whatsoever and the loss of the, of the piazza length. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the, these next two just try to show you a little bit of, of a, a graphic of, of, of the top one, the existing first floor plan. It shows the original main house in the red, the original footprint of the wraparound porch, what was the kind of infill that had been connected with the hyphen with an infill porch, and then the original kitchen house that stepped back. But again, the footprint as it exists now by virtue of all the additions um, is quite different. And, and we show that just, just for justification and uh, confirmation that, that the items that are being dealt with for the front are trying to restore it to, to more of its historic original form and the ones in the back, there, there's nothing historic left whatsoever back there. Um, next slide. Oh, so I'm sorry, uh, Jacob. Uh, so on, on the original, uh, uh, on the first floor proposal, what we are proposing to do is remove the, the, the infill, remove the bay, um, and off the back of the house now presently, which is about 80 feet from the street, um, there is a uh, uh, enclosure of screen. Um, with our proposal, we are restoring the front piazza door removing the bay so that we've got that nice long length of, of uncluttered and unencumbered piazza. Um, the enclosure footprint is reduced um, to, to what we are showing below and the front porch entry stair presently shown in the existing first floor plan masonry is, is being slid back just as a gesture to where the original main house and turnaround porch had been. Um, so next slide please. Um, uh, then upstairs, again, just the overlay to, to, to show you what um, uh, the, the kind of history of how, how it's kind of lost its, its character to the rear. And uh, on the upper floor, the, that infill area does remain, although we have uh, fenestrated it differently. Um, the bay gets removed, so we do have, again, that open porch area. And then the enclosure section in the rear, which is currently screened, is the footprint of that is, is, is shrunk and, and provides for a second stair, which really lets this house function as it probably should for such a large property. Uh, next slide, please. Um, third floor, again, just modifications, nothing affected from the exterior. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, roof plan, same, I can, can go forward. Thank you, Jacob. Um, so proposed front elevation is to return uh, piazza entry to the street, which on that portion of Lambeau is just, just beautiful. So this is a house that you just kind of walk by. It's unnoticed. Um, and, and I think it, it kind of uh, it returns some respect back to the neighborhood and the street. And, and again, Dioro is willing to go to that length to, to restore this property for their kind of forever home. Um, next slide. So the proposed um, uh, west elevation, uh, again, opening up the piazza at, at the first level, the, the, the sliding of that masonry stair element back to what was kind of the hyphen. Again, it's not anything that's gonna be anything other than a gesture that we all agreed um, was, was just nice to give some type of, of modulation to the structure. Um, the bay windows are removed as you see from the uh, difference from the proposed and the existing above. And then the area to the rear um, is, is the enclosure footprint um, in the non-original area is, is minimized and just encases the staircase. Areas now that I'll also mention too, uh, many of these windows are, are double paned, almost kind of low style 80s. Um, the owners want to return them back to traditional uh, mahogany uh, wood doors and uh, French doors, operable shutters where possible. Um, even on the areas in the existing infield piazza that'll be uh, fenestrated differently. So there will be windows behind those elements, um, but the, the, the shutters, much like a very handsome property across the street, um, piazza screen remains on uh, Limbolt Street. Next slide, please. Um, the rear um, is, is not visible from the public right away, but again, just an effort to let them be able to enjoy their garden from the master in the, in the great room. Uh, next slide. Uh, east elevation, again, just trim, siding, any kind of improvements we need to do on that for just repairs, but nothing significant whatsoever. I will mention, which is not necessarily a formal part of this application, but uh, 
hoping or assuming we're, we're able to move forward. But if you'll notice, uh, let me see, on the first level coming in from the rear, uh, that double ganged window kind of about midway down the building, um, it, it, we would like to, uh, with, with if there's a comment that could indicate support for that, we discussed that with Historic Charleston, return that to just a single window, which it was at one point. Um, it was something at one point in the original plan, which is a submitted to you. Uh, we were going to hang on to and not mess with that side of the building, but it, it just got to the point where it just seemed silly to not do it right. Um, so again, not formally a part of this application, but if we're able to proceed with any details to staff, just wanted to mention that for the record. Um, next slide, please. Um, just some section details about that entry piazza. Um, window systems that we're using in the screen or what was formerly the screen enclosure. Um, next slide, please. Uh, similarly there as well, they, they would be all wood mahogany windows. Um, in the rear, we are requesting to do a, a, a insulated clad window, um, uh, but all wood everywhere else, all forward of the street and, and as noted in, in the, uh, any repairs that we need to do. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so again, just a, a bit of a perspective, which is not a view you can ever see, as you can tell from the photographs we've submitted, but just to give clarification of, of what the intent is with the, the overall design here and what we hope are, are improvements. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are photographs that illustrate the existing conditions, the, the areas where we're returning the uh, Piazza door at, at Lamble Street, the, the masonry stair that exists presently, kind of in an odd location, uh, the current enclosure at second and first level, um, bay windows that we removed, the type of kind of Florida style uh, Lowe's doors and windows that are in the rear of the building. And that's all the section that is the definitely non-original. And just for the record, unfortunately, there is no real historic fabric left. Even the siding is all new. It's, it's, it's kind of a newer one by. So I imagine much of that was done in the 80s. Um, next slide, please. Um, this would kind of just substantiate that and just points out more of those elements that are uh, a little awkward and again, very 80s style and areas from the interior framing that we could tell things had been redone, sistered, filled in um, during prior renovations. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and then this really was just to, uh, uh, to explain a little bit of the, uh, the precedent of what we were trying to do with the proposed, specifically regarding the re-detailing of the, of the front piazza enclosure at the second level um, and the areas in the back where we had changed the current screen enclosure to uh, a glazed enclosure to accommodate a staircase um, and where we've been successful doing that before and maybe more visible and more significant properties. Um, so if, if I could maybe go back to front elevation, if that's okay, uh, and, and in doing so can kind of wrap and say that again, I can't think enough historic Charleston foundation because it was, a it was, a, a, a easement property for them. Um, and we spent a great deal of time, uh, on site and otherwise reviewing all of these items and they had, uh, helped work this out for us to something that they felt very comfortable and could support. Um, uh, I had spoken with Preservation Society as well, and I believe they were comfortable with what was proposed and, and said they had no comment or objection. And lastly, had distributed uh, letters and notes to neighbors up and down the street um, prior to our application, and I hadn't been contacted by any of them. So unless there's somebody here tonight that, that wants to speak one way or the other of it, we're not aware of any objections at all. So um, thank you. All right, thanks, Addy. Uh, does any board member have any questions right now? Or staff? I'll just ask real quick, is, are there any photographs, Eddie, of what it looks like before the incident in the 80s? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing, and that's such a nice way to put it, Ms. Morris. so thank you, but um, uh, no. And we've looked at Lambeau Street photos and tried to find, and, and, and unfortunately couldn't find anything, um, you know, short of now, I will say we did submit and that's why I was asking if I could share screen, not that you need to, but just for, uh, again, further confirmation, we did have copies of some very rough uh, and a couple pages of plans. I saw this, yeah. When the 80s were, yeah, that, that, that show mm -hmm. how it was 
done, but unfortunately, nothing other than that. Because there were questions, again, you know, whether or not the windows were one over one. Were they actually four over, you know, right. but, but no reference to, to any of that. Um, so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is Bill. Um, Eddie, a quick question. Can you uh, tell us of your inspiration for the new uh, entry door into the Piazza screen? Yes, sir. Um, and it, it, around the entire composition. Sure. Um, no, and, and, and basically where that, where that started, Bill, is, I mean, we looked at different things up and down Lambeau Street and similarly scaled houses. Um, and and uh, there were ones, as, as we all know, that, that had a pediment or a gable or this or that. Um, and, and, and those were attractive, but there were, uh, I think the other house on the street, which is a little more grand, uh, has a has a gabled um, uh, entry. So it felt like, eh, you were kind of taken away from that to do that. And, and it was a little more, again, stately home. Um, no offense to this property, because it's lovely, but, but, but it was basically trying to uh, discern from those what would be appropriate. Um, additionally, as, as you can tell, it's tall. Um, so proportion-wise, with the, with the retention of the Piazza screen, we were trying to do something that gestured to that. Um, and, and anything too low or, or out of the form left so much siding above that it looked odd. Um, so uh, that, that we, we landed on this one to give a, a light and inspiration into, I'm sorry, light into the door with the uh, transom into the uh, Piazza stair and, and the, the French doors. There, there's some on King Street that are very similar um, in theory. So just around that block, honestly, just, just trying to figure what suited the house best. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, if there's no other questions, we'll go to public comment. <clears throat> we have one public comment and it's from April Wood and she should be able to speak now. Thank you, April Wood and Stark Helson Foundation. ACF has an easement on 21 Lambeau Street and has worked with the applicant on multiple drafts for the proposed alterations at this property. After careful consideration, HCF has approved the requested changes at 21 Lambeau, including the partial piazza enclosure for the following reasons. Um, one, the rear port portion of the house has already been altered significantly. The former dependency has been widened and then a piazza has been added to this widened mass connecting to the original piazza. The hyphen has also been obliterate, obliterated. Two, because the dependency has been widened, the hyphen no longer exists, and because the piazza no, ra, now runs the entire length of the west elevation from the front of the house to the dependency, it is difficult to understand, to understand the evolution of the house or even see where the length of the original house would have ended. Three, the property owner is willing to reestablish a piazza door and open the first floor of the piazza at the street. Uh, four, property owner is willing to improve the existing second floor piazza enclosure to make this area more clearly read as a former part of the piazza. Um, finally, the piazza or property owner is addressing some of the previous poor alterations to the fenestration pattern along the piazza, including removing the non-historic bay on the piazza near the front door. Although HCF has a policy against piazza enclosures, HCF feels that this enclosure request is balanced by the preservation and positive improvements to the house and the removal of the enclosure closer to the street. HCF respectfully rec recommends approval of this application by the BAR. Thanks. Thank you, April. Um, there's no other public comment. Alex was here, uh, staff comments and recommendations. <clears throat> Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to go to our slides here. Okay, um, turning on Lambeau Street. Uh, the staff comments are first that generally this is a sensitive reservation, uh, renovation that restores the key elements of the original single house, um, recladding the second floor enclosure with columns, balustrade, and shutters to return the architectural vocabulary of the piazza as positive. The reopening of the piazza would be better. Um, number three, the new piazza screen design reflects other examples in the immediate context. In the absence of historically uh, historically, historic documentation of the original screen, the proposed design is appropriate. Typically, we'd recommend including a balustrade on the new enclosed portion of the piazza and the rear two bays. However, portion of the piazza dates from the late 20th century and was not part of the original. Um, the enclosure helped to break the mass. 
Number five, uh, the simulated divided light windows in the new enclosure are acceptable, um, but they should be fixed windows. And number six, uh, please just clarify the relocation of the electrical mast and downspout, uh, a minor graphic detail. The staff recommendations for final approval are with the comments noted. And I would also add that we think this is overall a very fine project um, to uh, reflect the, the, the totality of staff comments. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Um, Eddie, do you want to respond to anything uh, that you've just heard? <clears throat> Um, no, I, I, I thank you uh, all for your support and, and, and happy to address those comments at the staff level, most particularly electrical mass. We're working with uh, Dominion right now to, to get it out of that location. It's something that's acceptable to the city. Okay, great. Uh, all right, so on the board discussion, I think, Fillmore, I'm going to start with you first. Um, if you could kick us off with um, board comments discussion. Yes, uh, Fillmore Wilson, uh, I'll keep it short. I uh, agree with staff. Uh, I think this is a uh, uh, substantial improvement um, to the property. Thank you. Any other thoughts or comments from the board? Um, okay, this is Julia, the, the one who's not a man. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was gonna say, I really appreciate the proposed improvements to the existing infill, including that traditional piazza screen entry. Um, one thought I had just for, for consideration, would it make any sense to insert a corner board to acknowledge the original corner of that main volume? Just a thought. And, um, and then uh, oh, just a technicality, although I have the utmost confidence in this applicant, for consistency's sake, I assume he'll add appropriate details for final staff review, you know, the piazza screen details and the new stair, that sort of thing. But otherwise, yeah, I agree, it's, it's great. Um, Eddie, actually, I have a question. You, you had mentioned, uh, I guess, on the uh, west, you know, east side, oh, um, doing something with the window was it is it part yes. of the application or is it something that we need know it, it wasn't part of an application and again i don't want to be inappropriate with y'all other than to just say if, if it's something everybody's comfortable with that being resolved at a staff level i did speak in advance with uh april again at preservation society about that window it's a double ganged window which is odd because there are several throughout that house that were added in the 80s and this was clearly one of them and we'd like to just return it to a single window um, um, so that if, if it's okay with the board, uh, not again, if you technically approve it, but it would be okay to give staff the ability to okay that if they are as well. I, I would, I'll go ahead and try to make a motion for, um, final approval with comments noted and final review by staff and a board condition, uh, or a board comment that conversion of the double window on the east side to a single window is acceptable. All right, so Julia's made a motion for final approval with staff comments noted, um, final review by staff and a board comment that uh, conversion of the double window on the east side to a single window is acceptable. Is there a second? I'll second. A motion? Bill, I'll second. All right, so Julia has made the motion. Julia, excuse me, Bill has seconded it. I'll put that to a vote. Um, Bill? Yay in favor. Bill Moore? Yay in favor. Julia? Yay in favor. Glenn? Yay in favor. Chair votes yay in favor, so the motion passes unanimously. Okay. Mr. Thank Chairman, you, everybody. Point of order. Mr. Chairman, point of order. Yeah. Four minutes would be great right now, please. <laughs> so, also, a question for staff. Is the, city, yes, but... is the city funded pizza being delivered <laughs> now? It's, yes, it's on the way. <laughs> Do you believe me? It sounds like, uh, sounds like we're headed toward a, uh, toward a four minute intermission here. Yes, we'll take a four minute intermission. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.
looking kind of rainy up in North Charleston. All right, good. Um, Alex, I think everybody's trickling back in, so uh, you want to go ahead and kick us nice off? Nice wordplay there, Jay. There we go. Or, or, Jacob, would you mind kicking us off with 57 Lawrence? Absolutely, Mr. Chair. Happy to do that. Okay, just took out my screen share up. All right, we're all good. Agenda item number seven of 15 for, for the evening. So uh, moving along here quickly, 57 Lawrence Street. This is a request for final approval for the new garden hardscape and vehicular gate. Um, this is a category two property. It's in Ansonboro, circa 1836 in the Old and Historic District. Brief orientation, this is on Lawrence Street. Uh, only one property away from the corner of Lawrence and Anson on the south side. This is an existing site photograph. Um, and we're looking here toward um, East Bay Street and then looking back uh, toward, um, actually that was toward Anton, and this is one looking back toward East Bay. Um, here we are looking toward, uh, looking west toward Anton Street. This is the historic image from 1973, and with that said, I will turn it over to the applicant for presentation. Okay, I'm promoting Mark Abels to panelists, and he should be able to and mute himself and turn on this camera. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. I'll apologize in advance. It sounds like the sky is about to open up here at our office, and the internet in the metropolis of Hollywood is not so great. So if I drop out, I will dial you back up on my phone. You should be good to go. Um, I appreciate you taking the time tonight to look at our um, plan here. It is for 57 Lawrence. It is a landscape plan, landscape renovation um, for Chad and Stephanie Alvarez. Um, there are a few items that would come under the VAR purview um, that we can discuss um, hardscape wise and fence. So if, if you've got the plan, we can go through it. And if you want to just uh, direct me, sir, I will, um, I will go to whichever slide you like. Okay, um, you can go to the next slide. All right, a few things just to point out here, existing conditions, um, we'll be looking at, a. they've got an existing fence um, that is historic. And so we're gonna keep the fence, but we'd like to raise it and put a brick knee wall underneath it. Um, you'll see where their driveway is. They essentially have um, some Belgian black cobblestone runners. Um, we'd like to remove those and just add a solid bluestone parking court. And right now they have two sets of double wooden gates, um, nothing fancy, but we would um, eliminate those, add two brick columns and add one nicer double gate. So you can go to the next slide. 
Um, so there you see in plan view, the blue zone parking court, the layout, the footprint of the fence is exactly the same. Um, you can go to the next. So this is just a detail of what the, the knee wall would look like. The same, we would use the same exact fence, um, remove it and just raise it on top of this new brick knee wall. You can go to the next slide. Just a detail of a brick column, just a classic, you know, 18 inch wide double brick column. Next, next slide. Um, this is a detail of the gate. Try to treat, uh, leave the pickets up the top just to bring in some of that detail from the existing fence. Um, the column height is eight feet overall. Um, the fence coming in underneath there, scalping down to I think five, four, um, that range there. Um, next slide. Um, this is just a, showing you the, it's just the expanse. We're only adding the knee wall right there along Lawrence Street. Um, there you can see the whole, whole thing. Next slide. Uh, this is just really the planning plan. Um, not sure there's much further there that would interest you. So it's essentially the, that knee wall and front gate. And with that, I'll leave it to you all for any, any questions. Any questions uh, for Mark right now? <clears throat> oh, this is Bill. Just a very quick question for Mark. Are, are the pickets on the gate on the bias? Or are they oriented straight? Just that one little deep right here. The one, one yeah, and a half. They would be oriented straight just to copy the detail of the existing fence. Okay. Is there any uh, public comment? We have one public comment. And I'll allow April Wood to speak. Thank you. April Wood, Historic Charleston Foundation. HCF has an easement on the historic property at 57 Lawrence. Because the existing fence is wood and is set directly on, into the ground, it has constant wood rot and requires frequent repair. We believe it is important to keep this fence as it contributes to the historic character of the property. However, we understand the frustration associated with the with the constant repairs through the wood fence. The proposed plan to construct a knee wall and install the existing fence on top of the wall is a good solution in our opinion. We also believe that the proposed driveway gate fits the scale and grandeur of the historic house. Other changes to the hardscape will improve drainage and will have minimal impact to the historic character of the property. HCF has approved of the proposed changes to its easement property and we respectfully recommend approval by the BAR. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Jacob, how about staff comments and recommendation? Sure, Mr. Chair, I will go with those. Um, the uh, staff comments are, first of all, that the proposed changes to the historic fence to accommodate the knee wall below retains the historic fabric and helps prevent exposure to groundwater. Um, second, the new driveway gates are appropriate and nicely designed. The streetscape has many precedents for this type of design. And the third is we'd like to clarify the gate fence at the east end as the site plan and elevation drawings uh, don't exactly match up. Um, the applicant can do that uh, when they submit their final drawings. So staff recommendations for final approval. Okay, great. Mark, do you want to say anything in response to staff or public comment? You know, I appreciate their cooperation as we um, work through this and with the historic, with April, um, making a few tweaks along the way. Okay, great. Um, is there any discussion from the board? Could I, Julia, can I start with you? Uh, nothing to add. Um, move for approval. I think it's, it's good. Okay, Julia went right out of the gates and put a motion out there. Uh, is there Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Yep, just, hey, Bill. I just had one question, a follow-up question for the applicant. I guess I'm fine with the motion, but just one, one thing yep. I want to verify from the applicant. Is there going to be a um, a motorized actuating opener for the mm -hmm. gate? Yes. That is proposed, yes. On the drawings? Yeah, on the drive gates. Um, okay. Um, I know I know in the past um, this board has had some discussion about the, the, those types of, of appurtenances. Um, and I didn't know if potentially that could be at least a condition of staff review. Um, in this motion, the actual equipment uh, spec sheets and installation details. We 
you can certainly detail that. We understand the aesthetics, um, hopefully as well as anybody um, of hiding all that. Okay. They have, um, acknowledged that in their details. Okay. So, um, where are we? So, Joy, you just made a motion for straight up final approval. Um, do you want to recap? With staff conditions and with staff conditions and final review by staff. I apologize if I didn't clarify that. Okay. So Julie's made a motion for final approval, staff conditions noted, final review by staff. Glenn, did you second that? I did, yeah, as long as, I mean, I, I think clarification about the openers and either painting them or hiding them, whatever should be a, a part of that final review of staff. But yes, that, that's the second on my behalf. Julie, you want to sort of modify to say final review by staff to include, you know, review of the, the gate operating? Sure, whatever it takes. Okay. Um, all right, so Julie's made a motion for final approval, staff conditions noted, final review by staff to include review of the gate uh, opening mechanism. Glenn, you seconded that? Yes. Okay, so I'll call the roll. Um, Bill? Yay, in favor. Fillmore? Fillmore's recused on this one. Oh, my mm -hmm. bad. Sorry. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Julia? Yay in favor. Glenn? Yay in favor. Travis, yay in favor. Motion passes unanimously. Um, next gen item is 74 Anson. Very good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, you may want to notify Fillmore if you haven't already, but we're moving on to the next agenda item. Um, okay, agenda item number eight. Uh, this is uh, 74 Anson Street. Uh, this is a request for final approval for, um, wait, hang on. Yes, here we go. Uh, final approval for New Garden Hardscape, fence wall, and gates. Um, this is also Category 2 structure in Anson Borough, uh, circa 1812 in the Olden Historic District, and there are modifications dated in 1966 when it was relocated from 15 Wall Street, a street named that I don't believe it you know, exists anymore. Um, uh, this is actually immediately adjacent to the one that you just reviewed at the very corner of Lawrence and Anson. And this is the elevation from Anson Street, the elevation from Lawrence, and the intersection of Lawrence and Anson. And just context photos here. In this case, the building is to your right. And in this case, it's to your left. And this is uh, the historic image. And I presume this was at its previous, uh, its previous site. Or this was the previous, this, yes, uh, yes, it's all right, this is previous site. Interesting. Okay. Um, and with that said, uh, agenda item number eight, I'll turn it over to the applicant for presentation. All right, the applicant, Elizabeth Pope, should be um, a panelist now and can unmute right. and turn on camera. Are we good? Yep. Yeah. Okay, um, thanks for hearing this item tonight. Um, I'm gonna try to be quick since I know it's a long night for y'all. Um, the Dirks, the owners of 74 Anson Street, reached out to me to replace their failing white picket fences and gates. One fence and gate is located on the south side of the house, marking the end of the driveway. The second fence and gate is located on the north side of the garden between the piazza and neighbors existing pierced brick wall. Next slide. Okay, this is the existing site plan and shows, next slide. Okay, so this is showing the location of the two fences being replaced. One is on the north side at the end of the driveway and one's on the south side. Next slide. These are images showing the short under three foot and failing qualities of the fences and gates. The one at the end of the driveway has always been considered a utility area and houses multiple HVAC units, the grill and garbage and recycling. There is no clear path or walkway. The image on the bottom shows the existing white picket fence in the garden. Next slide. So this is just showing that the location is not changing of the existing fences and that a proposed brick walkway is asked to be built on a, the north side to connect the driveway and garden. Next slide. 
my prop by clients, the new owners of the property asked me to help them update their garden to work better for themselves and not to be an eyesore to their beautiful street. The design of the masonry wall and gate at the end of the driveway began with taking note of wood details on the house and a walk around Ansonboro. The new wall needs to complement the adjacent six foot tall masonry wall. The swoop in the new wall was added to be able to gain another foot of height against the house. The house has no first floor windows on this side. 74 Anson Street is a two story wood house and neighboring 72 Anson is a much larger and taller three story brick house. The added height against 74 Anson helps pull the scale between the two houses into play. When you are standing in the driveway and have no first floor windows providing a height reference, you feel dwarfed. The gate was designed as a solid wood gate as the side of the property will always be a HVAC utility area. The detail of the top of the gate was taken from the transom over the front door piazza of the house. The next slide. This is showing the existing white picket fence and the proposed replaced fence. The proposed replacement is similar in style to the existing fence, yet brings finer detail to the garden. I think adding a rail cap to the top of the fence and removing the visualization of seeing numerous tops of pickets creates a cleaner, less busy garden. Next. This is a detail of the new masonry wall. The brick and the wall cap will need to be antique brick to match the brick used on the adjoining wall. The existing masonry wall that abuts the proposed wall is covered in thick fig vine. However, the finish of the proposed wall will complement and closely match the existing wall. And that's the detail in the gate that is taken from the transom over the piazza door of the house. Next slide. This is the wood fence detail showing the replacement of the pickets with a rail cap. Um, and the brick walkway detail. Next slide. This house has an easement on it from the Historic Charleston Foundation and it was approved by April Wood on June 5th of this year. And that's it. Do y'all have any questions? Thank you, Elizabeth. Any questions for Elizabeth? Uh, yes, uh, this is Bill Huey. Um, Elizabeth, I wanted to make mm -hmm. sure I, I looked at your drawings correctly in your presentation. So it looked like you have um, a new garden um, fence and gate, uh, and you also have a new pedestrian gate, both nice, nicely detailed and stylized, but it looked like the driveway gate was just going to stay what it was. Is that correct? No. That, so if we go back to back, back, this is the existing driveway. Next slide. That, so this is the existing driveway gate on the left and the proposed on the right. It is the infill. Okay. I, yes. I understand now. I'm sorry. I, I didn't put that together. Thank you. That's okay. Another question for now? Um, Alex, let's do public comment. We have one public comment from April Wood. And you should be able to speak now. Thank you. This is April Wood, Historic Charleston Foundation. HCF has restrictive covenants on the historic property at 74 Anson Street. In fact, this is one of the historic houses that HCF moved in the 1960s to save the structure from demolition when the Gilliard Auditorium was constructed, formerly at 15 Wall Street. The existing hardscaping at this parcel is not historic. HCF has reviewed this request and has approved the changes to its covenant property. We respectfully ask that the DAR approve this request. And one side note, the photos that were in the, the introduction PowerPoint were actually of 61 Lorenz and not 74 Anson, just for clarification. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jacob, what is staff's recommendation and comment? Uh, I, I agree with Ms. Wood that after, after having saw, seen those images that I um, noticed that was in fact the wrong slide, so she's correct. Um, 74 Anson Street staff comments. Um, 
Proposed replacement of the existing picket fences with a masonry wall and the wood fence are well designed and thoughtful. Um, and number two, please ensure that the new masonry pier is constructed to leave enough space to allow for maintenance of the foundation and siding on the south side of the house. Um, the staff recommendation is for final approval. Um, okay, uh, Elizabeth, you want to say anything? Uh, as to anything? As a um, question mark? I will ensure that the um, new masonry pier is left, you know, there's enough space left. Um, we usually leave about four inches, but we will confirm that there's enough. Um, and thank you for your time tonight. Great. Um, Glenn, I will start with you to kick off board discussion. Um, okay, I have nothing else to add truthfully. I mean, I, I think that with HCF approving and with staff's comments, um, I'm comfortable with this moving forward. Anybody else on the board got anything Second to talk that. about? Got a motion? Yeah, this is Bill. I'll make a motion for uh, final approval with staff's comment. Okay, is there a second? Second. Who is that? Fillmore? Okay. Sorry, Glenn Gardner, second. Got it. Okay. Bill's made a motion for final approval. Staff comments. Glenn seconded it. I'll call the roll. Bill? Yay, in favor. Fillmore? Yay, in favor. Julia? Julia here, recused. But, oh, I'm here. Yay, in favor. All right. Glenn? Yay, in favor. Chair votes yay, in favor. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, next gen item is 12 Minotti Street. Let me go next to uh, agenda item 12 Minotti Street. This is a request for preliminary approval for the replacement of failing stucco with 5% square notch siding and replacement of windows and doors. This is a not rated building. Um, it was, uh, it is not, um, I, I, that's interesting. Uh, it is not in the Antiburo, uh, Historic Antiburo Neighbor Association. That's correct. Uh, circa 1997, and it, it is within the old and historic district. Um, this is a part of this new, uh, relatively new modern insertion of the neighborhood that is Minotti Street, as you probably all are all aware, off of Anson Street. Um, and these are just a couple of photos of the existing site. Um, this is uh, looking down Minotti Street toward Meeting. Um, flip side, looking back toward Anson Street. And uh, with that orientation, I'll turn it over to the applicant. Okay, we both applicants are now panelists. We have Bobby um, Funick, I'll let, I probably mispronounce his name, and Kurt Berg, and they can um, unmute themselves and turn on their cameras if they have it. Hey guys. Hey, Jacob, do you have Jacob? Do you have any of the other slides for the presentation we? We forward it to you all. Um, I, this is what I'll show you what I have. Good to see you again, Kurt, uh, former hey. colleague. Um, yep. Just uh, haven't seen you in a while. So just to show you, this is the set that we have. This is the set that was given to us. So That's fine. If that matches what you guys have or if this is familiar to you. Yeah, if you just want to advance a little bit to the uh, plan sheets and we'll, we'll go through. Perfect. So this um, client came to us with um, a, a lot of repair needs, um, termite, wet rot and the like, about 30% of the sheathing and framing over the whole um, building was um, affected and in need of replacement. Um, so the clients expressed uh, adamant desire to not go back with stucco, uh, would like to go back with a cladding. Uh, we're proposing a, uh, a fire percent cladding, kind of in the arson line, a higher end, uh, put over a one inch burring strip. And, um, and trying to take cues from the existing architecture, which was done by Edward Epps um, back in the late 90s, um, trying to uh, kind of pass off kind of a monolithic type structure with the, um, the stucco and mineral uh, controlled ones, unfortunately, that might have contributed a lot to the, uh, the moisture intrusion that resulted thereafter. Um, if you want to uh, advance a couple, uh, there, there are no changes to the interior program or the, the floor plan. This is all, all exterior reclad. And you advance again, we'll get to the elevations. Uh, this is the front elevation you can see up above the existing with kind of the monolithic uh, stucco down below. We've uh, proposed a kind of a square edge bevel, um, fiber cement siding. We would do miter corners um, in an effort to kind of give give back the monolithic look. Um, the, the proportions that were given to us by the original architecture and massing just didn't really lend itself to 
want to go back with um, kind of conventional casings. Um, so we felt like the, the building stood out um, in, a, in a good way on the street as being a nod to Charleston, but a nod to kind of a modern aesthetic as well. So we try to keep with that, but just we're trying to do that within the fiber cement materiality. So next slide. Back of the house, not much to see there. Uh, side of the house, uh, that is the west elevation. There is a half row window there. Um, fortunately, the windows um, is kind of beyond budget to um, remove and replace those. Um, some of them are in really good condition of steel windows, um, but budget's prohibitive of having them reinstall. Um, you advance to the, the next slide. The east elevation is probably the most prominent. Um, it has a lot of visibility from Bust. Um, and the, the large window there you see on the existing is, is enormous. It's, it's literally about um, 17, 18 feet tall, about 13 feet wide. Um, and it, is, um, it's, it posed our biggest challenge. Um, going back, we've, we've had to unfortunately divide it up just a matter to um, work within technicalities of what would be available to us as an impact rated window unit. Um, we've kind of kept the um, kind of the, the grid pattern with the structural millions, the, the heavier ones you see in the middle, and we have to subdivide those uh, factory mold units. But again, just again, just maximized on, on what comes available as tested product. And one more advance. And this is just kind of a color rendering and, and some materiality that we would like to pose for that. Um, color is still up in the air for debate, but this is kind of our first pass at that. Um, and then further on is that we have more um, Window details that we can discuss further, but that's pretty much it from us right now. I'll open it up to questions. Any questions? Um, this is Bill Huey. I uh, just that I just want to clarify which siding. So there was a, a V bevel shown and then a square um, on this slide that just got changed. Sorry, right, I'll go back to that. Green was. Yeah, the the vigorous siding. If you go back to the ASU of five, the um, kind of the um, the background um, soffit wall back there that's up in the um, up in the roof line um, that's that's right now a shiplap uh, kind of a tight dime reveal shiplap uh, that's painted kind of a off kind of a rusty red uh, we're proposing to go back with um, just something with some kind of slight variation from the um, from the metal siding okay so just making sure that so the main body is bevel and then the recessed area is v-group Yes. Thank you. Um, Alex, question. This is uh, an application for preliminary approval, right? Correct. Is, is there sufficient detail? Do they meet the minimum detail requirements for preliminary approval application? I, I believe so, yeah. They have some details following this, um, this okay. slide. Got it. Okay. Uh, any other questions before we go to public comment? Very quickly, Alex, could you Thumb through those, especially the window details. Just interested, interested to see that if they're in there. Mr. Chairman, you can keep going. I just wanted to look at those while people were talking. Hmm. While you look at that, Alex, we have no public comment on this one. Correct. No public comment. Okay. Why don't we hear um, staff recommendations then while Bill's looking at uh, the window details? Very good, Mr. Chair, happy to do that. And Bill, I have these details on screen share at the moment, but I'll um, go to staff recommendations. We can return to these details if you'd like. Okay, um, 12 and Street. Street. Uh, the staff comments are, first of all, that the original design of the house uh, works well in stucco. Um, the restucco would require new control joints that would detract from that design. So the BAR staff are comfortable with recladding the proposed B-gap artisan siding as it helps maintain uh, the monolithic feel of the stucco on the original intent. Uh, number three, the proposed thin windowsill uh, should be restudied to replicate the existing if possible. Number four, the proposed material palette is acceptable. Staff recommendations for preliminary approval with staff conditions noted and final review by staff. Okay, great. Um, Bobby or Kurt, did you want to respond to staff comments? Uh, I don't have any comments at the time. We can certainly go back and, uh, and, and look at the window products available on the market and see if we could could not uh, go back and replicating the, um, the east window uh, more. We'll take another look. There were some uh, there were some initial studies with the or discussions with the um, 
with the builder about going back with um, trying to reinstall the windows, which is going to be probably an, add an additional 15 or 20 percent to the project um, in cost, and then the replacing new with the the hopes windows was um, well beyond financial feasibility. So um, we'll continue to look at that, and we'll just um, again we'll, we're kind of pressed up against technical um, and, and trying to get a waiver try not to require the owner to have to put up uh, protection. Um, I know that you guys also typically like to have permanent protection in place. Um, it's kind of hard to cover a window that big. Um, so again, we're just, we'll, uh, we'll study and see if we can't find anything further. Uh, that might get us a bigger window. Okay. Um, all right, so we're in board discussion. Bill, I, I, I may have cut you off looking at the window specs, but so I apologize if you want to look at them again. Um, uh, I'm fine. I don't need to see them anymore. Would you kick us off in discussion? I think we're back around to you. Sure. Yeah, this is Bill. Um, I am uh, in agreement with uh, staff's comments and recommendation. Um, and um, I don't know how much longer it's going to be before we finally get rid of all these EFIS problems, but we're going to hit them one by one. Um, but uh, I appreciate the effort that the applicant's going through to get this corrected. Thank you. Any other board comments uh, other than agreeing with staff? Do I want to float a motion? Yeah, this yes. is to make a motion for preliminary approval with staff's conditions noted and final review by staff. All right, Bill's made a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Julia. All right, I'll put it to a vote. Uh, Bill? Yay, in favor. Fillmore? Yay, in favor. Julia? Yay, in favor. Glenn? Yay, in favor. Chair votes yay, in favor. A motion passes unanimously. All right, <clears throat> next agenda item is um, A.D. Alexander. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and item number 10 is 80 Alexander Street. This is a request for final approval for renovation to return the house to its residential use. This is a category category two rated structure in Zeke Ragboro. It was built circa 1800. It's in the old and historic district. And there's a third story, uh, which was damaged and removed in 1886 after the earthquake. So uh, just a quick uh, location in terms of contact. This is on Alexander Street in between Charlotte and Calhoun. Um, these are the existing site photos. This is immediately adjacent to the large hotel, which is under construction at the corner of East Bay in Calhoun. This building was used as an office for many years. This is looking north on Alexander. And this is uh, the 1973 historic image. So with that, I will turn it over to the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, we have Mark Clancy and Mary Martinick, who are now uh, panelists and can unmute themselves and turn on their cameras if they have it. Hopefully you Mary's can hear me. I'm oh, yeah, fantastic. I'm Mark Clancy. I'm an architect with Clancy and Wells. Um, Mary Martinich is uh, maybe joining us. I think she might be stuck kind of on, in this uh, storm outside. But I'm, uh, I'm just... here. Can oh, you all hear me? Hi, hey guys. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome aboard. Thank um, you. I think what we'll do is I'll start off with kind of a general introduction and then kind of throw it over to Mary uh, to talk about the site a little bit and then I'll wrap it up uh, getting back into the house. Uh, we represent um, 1776 development. They're also the folks that are developing the hotel next door at East Bay and Calhoun. And uh, part of the uh, arrangement with the uh, approval of the hotel was the uh, return of this 80 Alexander Street residence from a business occupancy back to a residential use. And um, I flip through, we've got quite a bit of images, but we'll go pretty, pretty quick. So um, I don't see any images yet of, of the uh, submittal. If you just want to direct me, uh, next slide, I'll advance for you. All right, um, all right, fantastic. Uh, next, please. <laughs> Um, the uh, house is of great, uh, and the property overall is of great historic significance, not just to the city, but to the country. Uh, the pasture outside of Mr. Gadsden's uh, residence had a large uh, live oak tree under which was read uh, one of the first drafts of the Declaration of Independence. So uh, we just want to assure everybody that we take, take this project with um, 
with very careful hands and we recognize the sens sensitivity and uh, the importance of the house in the property. Next, please. Let's just keep on going. There's uh, quite a bit of history that um, house lore uh, researched for us and um, good stuff. Next, please. Next, please. One more. Next, please. The connection is lagging a little bit. My apologies. No problem. Keep moving through this unless you direct me otherwise. Yeah, let's keep going. I appreciate it. I know it's, it's getting late. Of course. Okay. And, and let's stop here. So the first couple, uh, we did two steps. The initial thing we did was we, um, we uh, subdivided the larger property into two properties. Eventually there will be a, uh, our house, 80 Alexander's on the right. And then there's an empty uh, lot that's now on the left that will eventually be developed into a residential property as well. Next slide, please. This is also the rezoning plat where we went from general business to, uh, to residential. So that's also been accomplished. Next slide, please. And some uh, images, it's a, a beautiful house. Um, um, we really are, our proposed modifications are very, very minor, but um, you're seeing elevations here as it's seen from Alexander Street and then also the Piazza as it's seen from uh, on the Liberty site property. Next slide, please. You're seeing the north elevation of the house um, as you as you would see it uh, from the other residential property, and then uh, on the right upper right, you're seeing um, kind of from the from the from the east, also as viewed from the Liberty Hotel project site. Next slide, please. And some uh, shots of the piazza. Uh, one of the things we're proposing doing is um, removing that metal stair on the exterior metal stair. You can see it on the upper left uh, image. Um, that was a newer addition that was presumably added when the uh, house was used as a business. So we're removing that and gonna propose uh, basically turning it back into what it, what it originally was. Next slide, please. And that's uh, elevation as seen from Alexander Street. Next slide, please. Mary, why don't you jump in here and talk about the uh, site, proposed site development a little bit. Okay, um, just briefly on the site, um, we have some historic columns and historic gate at the entrance, right, where we're showing the carriage strip. Um, so we are planning to keep those as is. Um, and we have, you know, derived a lot of our inspiration from the existing brick. Um, so we essentially have um, the carriage strip there um, with the brick to match the columns as well as a bluestone court, um, little dining court in the back. So for reference, you'll see the brick columns and wall all the way on the, um, so I guess it's sort of plant east um, of the property. And those walls have been approved already through BAR large. Um, so really, you know, the gardens, we are just upfitting um, with clean lines, um, similar materials throughout, um, like I said, the bluestone and the brick paving can go to the next slide. And so this just shows some of the materials, the bluestone in the upper left, um, the brick paving. These are actual mock-ups of what we're using. And then the column um, number four that you see is um, going to tie into that historic um, entry gate and column. So um, that should all tie in really nicely together. Um, so this is an example of the materials that you will see within the site, which is not necessarily in the purview, but just to give you guys an idea of what's going on within the garden spaces. So that's pretty much it. Um, you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> this is just the, the planting plan, not of interest probably. Um, so that's about it on the site. Happy to answer any Thanks, questions. Thanks, Mary. Later yeah, one thing I might add is that, um, as you know, Mary highlighted, the walls that define the perimeter of the property and also the sidewalk and anything kind of there in the right of way, that's all part, that's not part of this project. That was a part, proved as part of the larger project by BAR at large, but everything within <laughs> those walls and the house itself, that's what we're asking you to look at. Next slide, please. 
Next slide, please. And I think we have a series of existing drawings. So you're gonna see the first floor, the lower, lower part of the slide, the second floor above. This is as it is now. Next slide, please. And some existing uh, reflected ceiling plans on the first floor and the second floor. Next slide, please. And the roof plan um, as it is now. Next slide, please. And existing elevations and kind of more of the same, what you see from Alexander Street on the right and then what you're seeing on the opposite direction on the left. Next slide, please. Elevation as we described before from the north uh, on the bottom and then from the south uh, from the top. Next slide, please. And some existing sections. Next slide, please. And some existing sections looking the other way. Next slide, please. So this begins the demolition um, uh, part of the set. And um, I guess what you're seeing is some different notation. Uh, we're showing the, the uh, exterior stair being removed. And we also have a, a, a we were at the, at the time of Seminole, we had planned on replacing all, all of the windows and uh, we we're changing a course on that. And we were gonna keep the windows and repair them. So we're not proposing replacing windows, we're proposing keeping them. Next, please. And uh, on the roof, uh, we are replacing the uh, HVAC system. So we're gonna be uh, adjusting and removing, replacing some of the ductwork that you're seeing on top of that appendage to the initial house. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And showing proposed, so uh, the stair is, exterior stair is gone. And um, we are a lot of interior work to turn a business into a residence, mainly adding you know, kitchens and bathrooms and things that are a part of the larger master bedroom. Uh, on the far right of the screen, you can see where we are uh, uh, proposing the two new condensing units. Uh, for the new HVAC system and also a uh, garbage enclosure. It's all enclosed with, within a screen wall. We have some details of that towards the end of the set. Next, please. Up on the second floor there. Uh, next, please. And we're showing the crawl space plan at the very top of the sheet. And um, we are suggesting replacing um, some of the um, louvers into the crawl space as seen from Alexander Street and also the access way uh, the, uh, from uh, into the crawl space from Alexander Street, uh, primarily because the, the, the decaying of some of the wood in the panels that were already there. And then on the right hand side of the sheet, you can see the uh, under understructure of the uh, mechanical enclosure. We've elevated the condensing units because the property is in a flood zone. So we're getting up above, above that. Also the, the lower uh, part of the sheet, we see the roof plan. Um, we're proposing replacing that portion of the roof only because we, of the amount of work we're doing on it. Uh, to the far right, uh, the appendage to the existing house. We will try not to do that. We will try to keep that existing roof and simply patch it so as not to disturb you know, what's there now. That's, so that's another change, I guess, from what we've, pr we've, pr we've presented. Next, please. Reflected ceiling plans. Uh, next, please. And then uh, the proposed elevations, you can see the on the right hand uh, image that shows from Alexander Street, the proposed new grill and access doors into the crawl space. And also on the far right, you can see the historic uh, gate and the piers that uh, are to remain. On the left, you can see the east elevation that shows the mechanical enclosure uh, to, the, to the east of the, of the house. Next, please. <clears throat> We do uh, propose uh, you know, repairing and repointing and cleaning that brick wall uh, on the north elevation. Next, please. And next, please. 
and some of the detailing of the uh, mechanical enclosure. It's wood, it's elevated out of the flood zone. Next, please. A lot of interior images. Uh, next, please. Next, and uh, let's keep on going, I guess. And we'll kind of blow through the plumbing plans here. I think we've kind of covered everything already. Keep going. I'm just going to MEPs here. Okay. There is something important at the very end. If you can stop right there, there um, oh, yeah, right there. Uh, there is an um, an outbuilding uh, that was used as an old carriage house associated with the um, with A.D. Alexander, and all that's left of that are the vestige walls, and um, so we've been tasked to preserve those, and we've actually made that this whole area um, where the vestige walls are part of a kind of a, a Liberty Tree Plaza to honor the, uh, the, the memory of what happened here on this site. And that was approved as part of the BAR large process for the larger project, but they really didn't get into the detail of how we are preserving those walls. So that's why I believe we were asked to present this to you folks. And uh, the approach here and um, Craig um, uh, Bennett and his team have, are assisting us in preserving these walls. And what we're doing, they're doing is designing kind of a steel structure within the wall to trying to be as un unobtrusive as they can and uh, basically preserve them, keep them, keep them standing. So that was their task and um, around the preserved walls will be built a, a, a plaza to, uh, in, a, in a memorial garden. Next please. So you can kind of see um, Craig's detailing here and he's using um, kind of a combination of a steel frame uh, placed the interior to the walls. It's, he's trying to be as unobtrusive as possible from the outside. He's utilizing uh, tie rods and um, patris plates in a manner that you know tries to give a little better lateral stability and resist some of the uh, wind loads and, uh, and possibly seismic loads. Uh, next, please. He's doing a really thorough job x-raying the structure and uh, just uh, it's, it's a very interesting process that he's going through to, to do just enough to make everything s stable, but not too much that it just screams out that we've got a bunch of modern stuff going on in, in the historic wall. Next, please. Next, please. And one more. And another. Next, please. And I guess we're just getting into some larger scale details of how the um, how the uh, tie rods and the uh, and the plates work. I think that might be it. We did include some of the elevations as part of the larger project just to give some context. I'm not really sure how much this this adds to the to the equation here, but if you look real hard, you can see the house <laughs> on some of these images. Um, and then this is probably the last image. So thank you very much for uh, the time and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you, Mark. Any questions of Mark or Mary right now? I have one. Um, I'm just trying to clarify where those walls that you want to stabilize are on the site. Do they show up on the site plan anywhere? Yeah, if you can go back to that first site uh, sheet uh, they're probably most clearly seen there. Bear with me for one moment as I get to that through my PDF here. Yeah, go all the way back to the L. Down here? One uh, point. Barely. One more. I think they are all. Yeah. They're, I think they're most clearly shown um, right here. They just barely appear at the top of this sheet. Yeah. I know. Oh, okay. Maybe the applicant can clarify whether this is a part of your submission or not, or if that's or if it's only informational. I'm. Well, I, um, the overall design was approved as part of the larger project, right. so I guess um, Lawrence asked us to review the structural support system with Kim, right. and this was kind of a long time ago and before COVID and everything. So here we are now and I, I i think the decision was made to just add it on to this project 
right. so that you all would have an opportunity just to see what we're doing there. And I, I think that um, just from a staff standpoint, I would advise the board that this uh, this is not a part of your formal approval that was on the BARL site, but this is being presented to you informationally as those structures were formerly accessory to the building that you're seeing today. That's my understanding of the, um, of the submittal. Thank you, Jacob. Right. Any other um, board questions? I think I have one for Alex. Alex, <clears throat> there are two things the applicant talked about that um, it sounds like changes that were made to the project or the application after submittal. One's the windows, and I, I see in your, we'll see in your comments soon that y'all are addressing those. Um, you mentioned something about trying to patch the roof as, a, as opposed to replace some portion of it. Is, are are y'all aware of that, or do y'all have any sort of, you know, comments about that? I just don't see those showed up in your comments. I'll make sure that you're, you've considered it. I don't believe that we were aware of that. Alex, do you know if Kim was informed of that mm -hmm. prior to? No, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, um, it was not something that we discussed as a group in our right. review. So we could, um, we could look at that separately if the board saw fit. All right, we can pick that up later. Um, okay. Any other questions before we go to public comment? All right, so let's go to public comment. Okay, we have April Wood. Hi, this is April Wood from Historic Charleston Foundation. We had a comment about the window, but see that that has, our concern has been resolved. We think this is a good project overall. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, unless there's no other, unless there's any other public comment, we'll go to staff comments and recommendations. Very good, Mr. Chair. So just going to our staff comment sheet here um, as these come up. Okay, um, this is A.D. Alexander Street. And the staff did have um, questions related to the, um, the windows that's been answered. The other question that staff had were um, whether any of the columns were proposed, were proposed for replacement. And I would ask that of the applicant. No, there are not. They appear to be in good condition. Thank you. Um, so on to the staff comments. Uh, First, removing the stair on the piazza is obviously a positive change to return this early single to its original form. Number two, on the existing intact windows, we're gonna skip strike number two, that's been answered. Um, they are in fact retaining and repairing existing uh, windows. Um, number three is the wholesale replacement of the existing windows. Do you strike uh, comment number three? Um, and uh, strike comment number four, those all relate to windows and the applicant has stated their intent to uh, preserve and repair. Number five um, is to submit details of any new walls inside that were not previously approved as part of the Liberty Hilton, which we uh, which we did discuss, and that can be a part of final. That's really just a review of, of detail. So the only relevant comments are one and five um, with the information that has been stated from the applicant. So the staff recommendation is for final approval with staff conditions noted. So, so since there's a little bit hanging out, Jacob, would it maybe like final review by staff uh, of the final approval on these last couple of details? Yes, that would be appropriate, Mr. Chair. Okay, all right, so uh, I guess we're on board. No, wait a minute. Um, Mark or Mary, would you like to respond to staff or public comment? Your review is very much appreciated. Thank you. Same, thank you. All right, so now we're in board discussion. Um, I think Maybe Fillmore, I think I left off with you. Would you mind starting us off to get us into board discussion? Okay, it's fine. Um, uh, I think I agree with staff. I have a question for staff. I'm assuming that the final approved plans will reflect the change about the windows. Is that correct? That that's correct, Mr. Because the plans that the plans that we have reviewed call the windows out to be replaced in entirely and I would not want to see that on a set of stamped approved plans from the BAR. <laughs> Understood Mr. Wilson and, and if, the, if the board wants to um, give staff direction in that regard we would obviously just request the full documentation from the applicant and we could review it at staff level if you saw fit. Okay that's that's my only comment. I think it I, I, I agree with staff um, I think it's a, uh, uh, a very nice plan and an improvement. Fillmore, I, I think I think we're all, you know, applicant, staff, board, we're all 
saying the same thing and thinking the same thing in terms of the windows, but as a technical matter, I, I, I think you picked up on something important, like the application is saying one thing and we're talking about something else. So. And, and the plans clearly indicate that, that that's part of the demolition is the removal of all those windows. Right, so maybe we just kind of tie that up and clean it up in a motion so we're all clear in the okay. motion of what's going on. But I, I, all right, I digress. So any other board discussion? Um, I was going to chime in and say I think it's a nice proposal and it's great to see this house returning to residential use. Um, I neglected to ask one question about the foundation screens at the west elevation, the front. Um, I'm assuming that's some sort of iron grade that you're proposing, but I could not find any detail in the, the middle. Um, can I just ask Mr. Clancy quickly if I'm interpreting that correctly? Yeah, there, we... Um... We may owe you a detail on that on that gate, on the um, access to the crawl space. Um, I did not see that on there either. Um, so I, I'm going to go ahead and throw out a motion for final approval with staff conditions one and five, and a board comment acknowledging that the applicant has withdrawn his request to replace the windows and final review by staff. Um, you want to do anything with the crawl space detail, Julia, or the uh, Okay, so then the or... board condition to provide details of the foundation screening. Uh, well, like at the West Elevation. Um, Mr. Chairman, potentially one more minute comment, and I believe if I heard uh, Mark accurately, uh, I don't know if the application stated a roof replacement, but he stated during his presentation it'd be more of a repair. Is that, I wanted to make sure of that. Now, I was letting, letting that go just because it's not visible, but okay, whatever. I just, flat I just didn't know if, you know, now the proposal was a repair, if that was just worded in as well. So, Bill, like, provide details on roof re repair, or e or even just a statement, because I, I my what I got from from the inference was the I guess the proposal reflects a, a roof replacement, and now it's stated to be a roof repair. I just wanted to make sure again, if we're talking about approving what's on the phone, I want to make sure yeah. that. Why don't we treat it like we're treating the windows, which is Julia said something like the applicant, there's an acknowledgement that the applicant has withdrawn the request to demolish the windows in lieu of um, repairing them in place. So, so almost like the, there's an acknowledgement that the applicant has withdrawn the request to replace the roof in lieu of patching and repairing. Does that work? Oh, we got a little, we got a little hodgepodge motion going on here. Any, anybody else want to throw something in there and before before Fillmore makes it? <laughs> or Julia? Julie, I think Julia's making the motion. Julia's making it. Okay. Now I'll just add anything you want. No worries. Yeah, right. All right. So um, Julia, Julia made a motion for uh, final approval of staff conditions one and five uh, noted and board conditions that number one that the we acknowledge that the applicant has withdrawn uh, the, the application to demolish the windows in lieu of uh, repairing them in place uh, for condition two to provide details uh, on the foundation screening at the west elevation and number three an acknowledgement that the applicant has withdrawn the application for roof replacement in lieu of repairing with final review by staff. Did I get that, Julia? Sure. Okay. Uh, did I get it enough for somebody else to second it? Second. Gardner, I'll second. Okay, I think I got Glenn on that one. So I got Julia making it, Glenn seconding it. I'll call a vote. Uh, Bill? Yay in favor. Bill Moore? Yay in favor. Julia? Yay in favor. Glenn? Yay in favor. Chair votes yay in favor. Uh, motion passes unanimously. All right, so the next agenda item is 346 East Bay. <clears throat> okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, agenda item number 11, 346 East Bay Street, uh, formerly addressed as 41 Calhoun. This is a request for final approval for the new construction of the two-story mixed use building. Um, this is uh, not rated because it's a new structure and it is within the old and historic district. It is not within the boundaries of, of uh, a neighborhood association. This is uh, the site that's located right at the corner of Calhoun and East Bay Streets, formerly used as a gravel parking lot. Um, here you can see it looking north on East Bay, looking south on East Bay. And to recap, the previous motion was for conceptual approval with the staff comments except number four and final review by staff. Um, the board comments were that it was a thoughtful design um, and they, they went on to basically, uh, you went on to, to um, more or less praise the design and then to give a few specific um, comments regarding the design itself. Um, this is coming back, uh, so previous staff comments included that um, generally that the building was a positive thing. Uh, number four, the material palette should be simplified, especially on the east elevation was called out specifically and staff recommended conceptual approval um, with staff comments and final review by staff. So uh, with that, we will go to the, um, to the uh, applicant's presentation. Okay, I think we have um, all three applicant presenters as panelists now. We have Blake Middleton, Jim High, and Will Morrison. Hey, can everyone hear me? Yep. All right, hi everyone. Good evening. <laughs> this is Will Morrison with the Middleton Group, and I should be joined by a Zoom or by phone, however we want to call this, by a Jim High and Willis High of the Delta Pharmacy team and Blake Middleton. Um, we'd like to begin the presentation tonight. If you could flip uh, to slide three. All right, perfect. Yeah, just a nice image to put in the background. Um, we'd like to start tonight um, with Jai just saying a few introductory words uh, to begin the presentation. So I'm going to digitally turn the mic over to him right now. And Mr. Hai, you may need to unmute yourself uh, because you are currently muted. Um, if we have technical difficulties, I can proceed with the architectural portion of the presentation. And it, come. it actually looks, I might have, it looks like he called in. Hold on, I have promoted. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure if it was, let's see. Okay. Mr. High should be able to speak now via phone. And he'll need to unmute himself uh, via phone as well, which involves, um, Pressing star six if you are on your phone. There we go. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Oh, okay. I, I appreciate your time. I know you're tired. Uh, I'm Jim High with Delta Pharmacy, which was started by my dad 85 years ago in 1935. Next to me is my family and my son, Willis High, who is CEO. We represent four generations, including my grandson, who just got in after making deliveries. We were, we, we were here in December approximately eight months ago. I left that meeting excited because we were on our way to building our flagship and dream pharmacy without having to leave the peninsula. The bar had given us essential approval to our concept and design. The Preservation Society, Historical Society, and Neighborhood Associations gave strong approval. We tried to recapture a resemblance of Charleston's history and your mission statement. We are retail family pharmacy that serves downtown Charleston, the homeless shelter, the Citadel, College of Charleston, and several nonprofits. We offer free delivery. We have serviced wonderful people for over 10 years in the Peninsula City. We're running out of time before we have to move and we do not have unlimited capital. A retail pharmacy must have a building that is conducive to shelving, a robot, vaccination space, consultation space, 
and it must meet Board of Pharmacy standards. We need your help in order to get started. We cannot shut down our pharmacy and restart filling prescriptions at a later date. Our current landlord has plans to tear down the building we are in. We want very much to stay on East Bay and not relocate to another area. We love downtown Charleston. We want to be part of Charleston's downtown and continue to serve our wonderful customers. I want to thank you for your time and your service. Have a good night. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'll be as succinct as possible, and I might be testing, Jacob, your ability to uh, flip through slides, but um, I will uh, try and uh, keep you apprised as to where I am in the presentation. Um, okay. As Jim uh, mentioned, um, we, were, we met back in December and presented the Delta Pharmacy Project to the board and were granted conceptual approval with staff comments, excluding staff comment number four, with final review by staff. We continued to develop the drawings throughout the architectural process and got through to permit and then submitted these drawings um, for staff review. At that time, we were notified by the city architect and staff that they felt that the board should ultimately make the final decision on the appropriateness of certain revisions specifically relating to the fenestration requested in the original staff comments number five and number six relating to the east elevation and the south elevation. So I'm gonna to try to kind of hone in on just those comments and explain to you why we made the revisions we did and why we think they're appropriate. So if you could flip uh, two more slides, Jacob, that'd be great. Absolutely. Perfect, uh, actually one more, yeah, that's great. Um, this is an elevation looking at the east. Uh, this is a perspective face, oh, too far. This is a perspective facing the east elevation of the building in which staff, original staff comment five um, stated, quote, fenestration should be included. We originally, um, I, I would have you go to the, the comparative elevations, but um, I'll have you go there in a minute. I'm just gonna talk here for a minute and then we'll go there. It's farther along in the presentation. Um, so we added four new windows on the first floor of the pharmacy brick volume right there that matched the uh, four uh, windows above. And we also added three windows at the dependency at the back in the same residential style as other parts of the building to try and um, you know, harken back to that dependency's more residential um, nature. We feel that these additions compositionally improve the facade and help delineate the different two different programs of the two different volumes while also meeting the intent of this original staff comment number five. So if you could go forward um, to Slide number 11. I don't know if they're numbered for you or, or what it looks like, but um, you keep going. We're going to be going to the elevations. So one more, I think. No, it's one more of those. There it is. Okay. So this shows the comparative elevations. So those are the four new windows on the first floor and the three more on the, um, the dependency there. I guess at this point, we feel it's important to note that, and I'm sure everyone has reviewed this draw, uh, these drawings, but it's a very small pharmacy, a small facility on a small site, and we're bound on three sides of the site by property lines, and on the other side by, you know, a, a zoning uh, sized um, area, which is required for, you know, not to get into that. But so we don't really have room to grow the um, proportions at all, and we're happy, and I'm sure you're happy based on the previous approval with the height, scale, and mass of the project. So we're sort of limited in our footprint and to have an operational and functional um, pharmacy at this site, we need to have back of house spaces, not only for the function of the building itself, but also for the pharmacy because they deal with controlled substances, they have need privacy for various rooms and et cetera. So to make a functional uh, floor plan for that, we had to move the back of house spaces to the perimeter of the building so that there is a functional central space. And we, had, and we talked about this at the last meeting as well, and which is why we we're trying to keep that first floor as opaque as possible. Um, we agree that adding these windows um, ad adds character to the facade and, and, it, and it works compositionally, but um, it, it adds some uh, complexity to the function of the spaces within the building. And as a result, as a compromise, we would um, like the board to consider allowing us the use of either translucent or opaque window finishes, such as a film, 
um, at, at this first floor at these certain back house spaces so that we can you know, ensure the security and privacy of the function of the pharmacy while maintaining the uh, aesthetics associated with windows. So um, during your deliberations, we, we would ask that you consider that. In this presentation, we're showing vision glass. We know that the BAR, um, that the, the BAR uh, principles state that, quote, clear glass may be encouraged on storefronts on ground level, but we would ask in this situation that you allow us um, to look at that. So if you could move one more slide forward, Jacob. Thank you. So the other staff comment that the um, staff would like the board to review here tonight is uh, staff comment number six, which regards the south elevation, which the original statement was, quote, the south elevation has zero fenestration, and that should be addressed as well. So we spoke at length at the last meeting, and, and we've spoken with staff at length about the fact that we are too close to the property line to have meaningful fenestration on that elevation. And there is no room to cut in. We would need at least three more feet from the property line or three foot one to be able to have a more meaningful elevation. We can't afford to lose that space in this very small facility. So as a compromise, we, we took this as a design challenge and as a design opportunity. And we feel like we've come up with a good compromise. And the compromise would be to add a chimney on the back of the south elevation here, which helps add visual interest to the building works both compositionally and contextually with this type of building. Um, we feel that it uh, helps anchor the end of the building and it gives it that the dependency a more residential feel. So we feel, and then um, on the, you know, now that, that elevation is broken up into two smaller sections of brick, we feel if you could go back actually to the renderings, um, I think it should be slide number four. So you can see all the aerials as we go through. I just wanted to, okay, yeah, that's perfect. I wanted to show it in, in perspective because I feel like um, looking at elevations, people can sometimes get kind of boxed in because, uh, you know, as humans, we see things in perspective. And I think it's important to look at, at it as a composition as opposed to just an elevation blank on the page. So as you can see here, it, it's proportionally makes sense. And we don't feel that any fenestration on this wall is necessary or as, or as would make it any more aesthetically pleasing. Honestly, um, it would might get too busy and whatnot. Um, and then I know at the last meeting, um, just as an aside, uh, it was mentioned that, you know, on, on such important streets that it's important that we don't have blank walls. We don't have walls without interest and that is normally accomplished through fenestration. And I just wanted to bring up, and we don't have to go to it now unless it comes up in uh, the, you know, further board discussion. But um, there are multiple buildings of historic nature of the same, you know, same proportion, same vernacular within just even the immediate area of this site that have blank facades. And they are not um, distracting and they're not problematic because they make sense programmatically and visually with the you know, context of the building itself. So having said all this, you know, we feel that the changes that we've made since conceptual design do improve the overall aesthetics of the building. And we feel like this is gonna be an asset and a celebrated building for the city. So we would request that you consider granting us final approval this evening, and that you consider allowing the use of either translucent or opaque glass treatments for the back of house spaces on the first floor. Thank you everyone for your time. I know it's late and I try not to go too long. So uh, please let us know if you have any questions. Um, thanks, Will. Any questions from the board? Um, Bill Ewey, do you, is there any functional element you could use that chimney for venting water heaters or anything just to say it actually is in service in some form or fashion? Yeah, we, we actually are using it functionally. We're using it um, for the hood over the range at the kitchen on the second floor and we're also planning on using it, like you said, for the, um, uh, the, the uh, water heater. Thank you. Any other questions right now? Okay, let's go to public comment. No public comment on this one. No public comment. Okay, how about um, staff recommendations and comments? 
Thank you, sir. I will go to uh, staff recommendations and we're gonna have some changes based on what we've heard in, um, in the applicant's presentation and Q&A. Just get through our details and... Okay, here we go. Um, 3460 Space Street. Um, so you all understand why this is back, um, returning to the board because of modifications. Um, and also there was discussion about the, the question um, about windows being fixed and being clear glass. So the applicant has, has requested that we consider, um, that you all consider as a board um, treatments to glass. So you can disregard the introduction in that staff question because I think that the applicant has made clear that he wants you to consider um, glazing or other treatments on the ground level. So in regards to staff comments, number one, um, the applicant has satis satisfied the conditions by narrowing the driveway, adding the site wall to screen the parking and adding fenestration on the east elevation as requested. Um, you can strike comments number two and three, which relate to the chimney. We also believe that it was, we were under the impression, maybe we misread documents, that it was a false chimney. Um, however, it, if it is in fact functional and it is venting the hood, then we support the chimney deep down in our hearts. The staff for the record have a hard time with false things that are added on, but if it's functional, we like it. Um, so you can strike comments number two and three. Um, comment number four is that all uh, new alterations are appropriate. And also, again, we're changing a few things, but the record reflect that, that uh, number five, light fixture should be electric rather than gas, is in fact a hotly debated topic within the staff. <laughs> and we would, uh, we would lean to the board's uh, discussion about that detail, um, however you see fit. Uh, item number six, um, relocate, if you can, please relocate the wall vent from the south elevation at the west corner. This was indicated in the rear elevation. It's a small wall vent, if possible, um, to study that location. Um, number seven, uh, we will request a mock-up panel and due to the prominence of this location and we um, we can work with the uh, with the applicants directly to discuss the scope and size of said mock-up panel but we um, we just want to make sure that we understand how the details will be executed by the contractor again just due to prominence um, and number eight uh, this building we think will be an excellent addition uh, to this overall prominent corner and we uh, we're we're Overall, very happy to see a local business going into a thoughtfully designed building. So the staff recommendation is for final approval with staff comments noted and final review by staff. Sorry about those wordy and convoluted comments, Mr. Chair. Uh, they're now clear, thank you. All right, so um, Will, do you want to respond to uh, staff comments? Yeah, I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, so I guess just Moving forward, um, whenever whatever the motion is, uh, we would ask that you know, like Jacob said, that we we note that we struck comments two and three, and then also um, just just for everyone's knowledge, it's it's my understanding that um, the only light fixture that was proposed to be uh, gas was the um, the pendant over the main entry at the corner. So we felt that that was a prominent corner and and was meritorious of of such a such a fixture. So, you know, we'll, we'll leave it to the board to discuss. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Mr. Julia, Chair, Mr. Chairman, a point of order. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Fire away. I did want to ask um, staff if there were any supplemental comments regarding the opacity of the window film. This topic, uh, to my recollection, was not discussed in our in our staff discussion. Alex, do you have any recollection of specific discussion? It was we were just unsure which or if any windows were going to be opaque, um, and you know, per the per the principles, and more on the ground floor that are translucent, the better. That's yeah. So we would um, we would lean to the the board um, and certainly uh, feel free to question the applicant as you see fit. But it was not specifically discussed, um, other than our, our obvious preference to have transparent glass when possible. May, may I interject? I don't want. To... Yeah. Well, are you proposing them on the east elevation of the ground level? Which one? Yeah. So we we originally um, and this might have been something that got lost in um, translation because we were having a we were having correspondence back and forth between Dennis. Um, Alex, ourselves, and um, when we were speaking with Dennis, we sent over a proposal that showed which windows would be would have this film. And um, there was there were some on the west elevation, some on the east elevation. Uh, specifically, um, the uh, ones on the east elevation that are in the production area 
um, where it is essential that there is no light transmittance into that back area. And on the east, it was for the restroom and for the, um, uh, like the, the private um, patient care room. So, um, you know, we'd be more than happy since it, it looks like um, the recommendation was final review by staff, we'd be happy to continue to work with staff, staff as to which um, windows we we're proposing to have that treatment on. Okay. Um, let's go to board discussion and Julia, if you could lead us off and um, real quick, Alex, could you throw up the East Elevation just so we could look at it while we talk about it? Or maybe Jacob controls it, I can't remember. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm driving it um, and I will uh, do my best to find said elevation. Um, Will, I believe, said also that some of the windows on the west on the elevation, west. I presume the ones at the back, the south side, also need yes. to be. Hmm. Um, all right, so I continue to think that this is a really thoughtful and strong design, and um, and knowing that the chimney is doing something. I think that's a totally fine solution for providing a little interest at the south elevation. Um, regarding the window film, I'll be honest, I don't know where our purview starts and ends on that, but I've got to think there's some way to provide them privacy that they need for their business functions. And I think it's, we'd rather have a window with some sort of non-permanent treatment than just not have a window at all. If I, if I may, Mr. Chair or Ms. Martin, just add to that comment. I, I assume you're, I assume you're acknowledging me. Um, the, the historic way, the, the, the typical way that we would do this in an historic building, as you probably are aware, when we have blank windows where programs are, are, have been changed internally, is that we recommend black painted panels to be included on the interior of the building as opposed to glazing the window itself. That is the commonly accepted practice which we endorse throughout historic buildings in the city, which have a, an historic version of this same condition where the interior program does not require or can't include light. So um, you may consider that in, in your motions. Don't want to guide you too much, but that is a commonly accepted technique um, of providing an interior black uh, uh, panel. That's a good point. I wasn't even thinking in terms of how we treat historic situations, but it seems like that might be a fine on the mask. Yeah. Um, Glenn Gardner, <laughs> I just have, I have two comments. I, Jacob, I think that was a good, a good point. I also was going to bring up that the board has approved uh, new construction with um, obscured glass windows on Mary Street in a um, in a commercial restaurant space. I, I'm not saying I love them, but we've approved them. And so I remain incredibly supportive of the design and of their project. And so um, to me, I think these are easily resolved items. And I think either way with the, the windows, it's on what I'm calling the back side of the building. So I'm comfortable whatever direction the other board members wish to go. And then the chimney being somewhat functional, I am completely supportive of that as well. Um, they'll ask us to, to address the electric versus gas. I guess our policy there is so that nobody would confuse that, the, that it's an old building if it has gas or I, I, something along those lines. I mean, to me, it's a cool feature. It's going to be a cool thing at the corner. And I don't think anybody would confuse the pedigree of the building or the, the historic nature of the building. Um, those, those are my two cents on electric versus gas. I agree completely. I, I agree as well. I think, I think if, they're, if they're asking for one kind of signature a uh, fixture that's very different from putting 10 of them on the building. What else? Uh, um, all right, any other discussion or somebody think they can condense this into a motion? I'll try to make a motion for um, final approval with staff comment one for 
six, seven, and eight. And a board condition to treat the window um, uh, what is the what is the obscurement? What is that word? I don't know, sorry. Treat the window, treat the um, light containment as we do with historic windows. Let's work with staff to resolve that. I think that's it. Um, okay. Final review by staff. Okay. Um, is there a second to Julia's motion? Uh, Glenn Gardner, I second it. So, um, okay, I'll put it up for a vote. So, Bill? Yeah, in favor. Phil Moore? Yeah, in favor. Julia? Yeah, in favor. Glenn? Yeah, in favor. Chair votes, yeah, in favor. Motion passes, yeah. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Next agenda item is uh, 61 Reed. Hey, um, I remember 12, 61 Reed Street. This is a request for conceptual approval for new construction of two single family residences. This is in an east side neighborhood district. This is the uh, height district is two and a half to three, and it's in the old city district. And site orientation, here we are uh, close to the corner of Reed and Nassau. This property is on the south. Uh, side of Reed Street. This is an existing site photo. This is looking east on Reed Street. Going to spin around looking west on Reed. And that orientation will turn it over to the applicant for a presentation. All right. Kevin Harderfer is now a panelist and can unmute himself and turn on a camera. I'm hoping you all can hear me. Hey, Kevin. Evening. Um, so if you want to start uh, um, the slides, This I'm going to is do, direct me. Um, I'll go from here. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so existing site has a house um, that was built uh, in place of a historic Charleston single house, probably about 30 years ago. Uh, next slide. Uh, as you can see on the survey, next slide. Um, this is in existing conditions. Uh, next slide. Uh, and that's the proposed demolition. So the BAR approved the demolition on staff. Um, next slide. And then this is the proposed development for the site after talking with zoning and BAR uh, for what would fit and what would be appropriate. So there's two submittals as part of this. This is the house A submittals. Next slide. Again, existing conditions and zoning. Next slide. Uh, a historic plat um, showing the property, which is on the left side of the slide. This is Reed Street on the bottom, Nassau Street on the right. Um, and it shows the original two-story wood frame Charleston single house on the west side of the lot. Next slide. Uh, existing condition showing the proposed house to be demolished that's been approved. Next slide. Uh, street view. Next slide. Um, other street view, next slide. This submittal, um, next slide. And then you can just run through this series of plans and elevations, um, probably stopping at the front elevation. So this 
house is proposed as a traditional looking Charleston single house in keeping with the style of um, something that would have been built in the early 1900s, um, comparable to what would have been there uh, previously appropriate to this street and, and the context. It is a, a three story, a two story with a roof um, uh, or attic within the roof with dormers as you see, next slide. Um, next slide. And then the street elevation showing the height scale and mass and how it relates to the houses on both sides of the street. I will add that the, um, the eclecticism of vernacular architecture on this stretch of Reed Street is quite interesting if you haven't checked it out. Um, there's quite a range, both good and bad in my opinion. Um, and, and like I said, this is hopefully a pretty straightforward um, presentation for a traditional looking Charleston single house. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, questions right now? Question. All right, we'll, do, we'll go to public comment. Wait, I do have a question. Jay, I'm sorry. Yeah, are you? Are, are we doing both of these uh, once with public comment and everything? Or how's that working? Yeah, I think it's all one application. So um, we're going to hear everything all together, A and B. Is that right, Alex? Yes. Okay. okay. So oh. should I run through? There's a whole other slide set for House B. Do I need to run through that as well? Yeah. You should, that, that should be in here too. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Just real quick, I do have a couple of questions about this house. Just a couple. Um, okay. uh, Kevin, can you tell us the um, ceiling heights on each level? Um, give me a moment. I think the first floor is... Uh, 10 or around there and the, the second floor is eight and a half 12. and the, the attic is eight. It's uh, called it out as 12, 12 for the first, nine for the second and then it looks like um, it's different conditions in the half story of the attic. But I, I'm seeing 12 and nine for the first and second floor. Um, It's a two, it's a 10 foot ceiling height. Uh, it's a two foot truss um, on the first floor and then a nine foot ceiling height on the second floor. Okay, sorry. No, I'm seeing 12 and then two feet of a floor structure and then nine on the second floor. I don't know, I don't know if you all can see um, the zoom here on this screen. If you can read those dimensions. Yeah, so that's a 10 foot okay, ceiling gotcha. height, right? Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, I had a hard time reading it when it was that small scale. Thank you. Okay, so, um, yeah, so actually, Kevin, we are going to take up both A and B. And, and so we'll take public comment, we'll take board um, recommendations. So if you want to add some more presentation on B, now would be the time. Okay. Um, Jacob, if you want to keep going and then you can just jump to the, the site plan identifying right there, um, house B. So this is located in the back of the lot, um, you know, with the zoning requirements for parking and, and the setbacks uh, obviously want to be cognizant of um, where it is on the on the site. It, it is pulled all the way back. It's a very um, unique shaped lot, and and we managed to kind of rotate this around to uh, to to fit uh, something that we think is appropriate. So you can go ahead and go to the floor plans. Uh, first floor plan, um, second floor plan, uh, and then roof attic plan. Uh, so the, the building elevations are uh, contemporary. There, this is, um, we, we looked at this as a simplistic rear of back of the property house. So in looking at the vernacular of, you know, back houses, kitchen houses, um, obviously they're very, 
very functional <laughs> as well as just um, or basic and then just functionality based. So we took that concept um, and put it obviously in a contemporary context uh, and then applied it to this house. It is again two stories with a another story in the attic. Um, it's smaller in scale than the front house, uh, so it is subservient in that regard. Um, in terms of cladding, we are looking at a, a wood clad panel system for both the walls and the, the roof, and then a, a simple um, glazing system um, that in, in the pattern that you see on the elevations. Next slide. And then the, the, the other two side elevations and then the last slide. And then you'll see on the streetscape elevations how this building is, is diminutive compared to the front building. It is recessed back. And then the only other um, thing that isn't added on here is the, the existing elevations or the existing streetscape with the trees and the vegetation and, and, the, and, and all the things that would actually impede your views. Not that that's necessarily good or bad, but obviously the views of this building from the street are, are, are going to be glimpses at best um, for, for, for what it's worth. Thank you. Okay, so I'll ask Board if there's any questions on B or A, you're welcome to ask anything and then we'll, if not, we'll move on to public comment. Uh, yeah, this is Bill. I do have a question uh, regarding building B. I uh, want to make sure I Saw that right? So you're saying it's a wood composite panel roof. Is that correct, Kevin? Correct. So we're looking at a couple options. Um, it's going to be wood in nature, whether it's um, uh, site, like a few things that we've, we've developed or looked at. One would be cypress and coming up a paneling system out of cypress. Another would be a koya, which is a, essentially a chemically altered natural wood. Um, that you could submerge in water, um, it's termite resistant, um, or even some reclaimed old growth heart pine that we would uh, panelize and use throughout the facade. And, and again, it is the roof as well, correct? Correct. All right, uh, any other questions right now? Um, I, I wanted just to ask um, Kevin if you could sort of articulate the concepts of the, the two designs, like coexisting and what, if there's anything to explain there, if they're just completely different or what the, what the genesis of that was. How they relate to each other? Yeah, or what, yeah. They're being built at the same time. I'm just curious what your thought was about making one so different from the other? Yeah, I mean, so there, a, part of it is is looking at them as two separate houses and structures, um, adding some vitality and interest to the site development. And then also kind of going back and, and looking at what that back house typically does as a purely functional house and just stripping it bare um, and looking at it from a contemporary standpoint. Thank you. I think the play between the two um, would be in the material and the scale. Uh, I, you know, I'm, the intent is to add the elements of material across the houses, whether it's, you know, the type of wood species or some of the, the detailing, um, you know, on, on whether it's inside or outside, just pulling pieces. There's also kind of a, a, a shiplap wood element that wraps the front that you don't see from the street. Um, that's part of the entry portico um, on, the, on the back house. And so there would be elements from that piece that would be um, pulled into the, the front Charleston single house as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Bill, Julie, anybody else? Any other questions right now? No, okay. Um, Al or, yeah, Alex, let's do public comment. We have three public speakers. We'll start with Jenia Galloway. And she can unmute herself and speak. 
Hello. Hi there, are you able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Um, we own uh, 68 Reed Street and we've owned that property for quite some time and several other homes in the neighborhood since the early 1900s. As much as we do welcome wonderful and beautiful, aesthetically pleasing um, changes to the block, we're very, very happy to see the change come. Um, I may be struggling though a tad bit with the structure in the back. As the gentleman stated earlier, you know, there are several different looks. Um, I would like to bring it a little bit more congruent. And even though the former house was a sore spot for us for such a long time, it would be nice to just, you know, kind of work together to bring everything on one accord. But we do welcome the people to the block and we welcome the changes, but I do struggle with the structure in the back. Okay, we'll go next to April Wood. At April Wood Historic Charleston Foundation, our comments primarily involve Unit B. HCF has reviewed this application uh, for the single family residents at the rear of the property. Before HCF can recommend approval or denial of this application, we believe more information must be submitted by the applicant to demonstrate the visibility of the proposed building from South Street, Nassau Street, Hanover Street, and Reed Street, and how its size and scale compares to the surrounding buildings. We recommend deferring this application with the request that additional information is submitting, submitted showing the massing lines of sight and the streetscape. Thank you. And now we'll go to Erin Minigan. Thank you, Erin Minigan, Preservation Society of Charleston. The Preservation Society has significant concerns with this application. We feel the siding of the buildings is being negatively impacted by the program. Rather than responding to the contacts and typical site planning patterns for Charleston, the building's locations are being driven by the driveway and parking spaces necessary to accommodate the desired unit count. We are also concerned with the proposed architectural direction of House A and feel the design should be rethought to better read of its time. While neighborhood examples should be studied to inform the design of the house, we feel that many of the details proposed, including six over six windows, turn balusters and rounded columns are too literally traditional. Also, we feel the L-shaped massing concept and truncated piazza are unsuccessful. Whereas we felt House A is overly traditional, the form, materials, and design of House B is overly contemporary and foreign to the surrounding context. We are also concerned with the quality of the proposed material palette, particularly the use of composite wood panels for the entirety of the exterior, including cladding and roofing. Overall, we feel the front and back buildings should relate architecturally as well. Given these concerns, we ask for denial of this application for complete restudy. Thank you. Uh, any other comments uh, on the phone, Alex? No other public comment. I got a, a letter here uh, from Steve Bailey, who uh, lives at 38 Nassau, who writes that I uh, lives at 38 Nassau on the east side, about a block from 61 Reed. We fully endorse the project. I'd like to get it built soonest. This particular property has been a blight in the neighborhood for a long time and putting two single family homes here seems ideal, particularly like the second home, which is more contemporary. Please approve it. Steve Bailey and Be Beatrice Bernier. Um, all right, so let's go to um, staff comments and recommendations. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we've broken these into, into two separate houses. So um, on 61 Reed Street, staff comments for House A are that while the general architectural direction is positive, the scale and massing are unsuitable for the site. Um, number two, the orientation and forward massing of the building is suitable. Um, number three, the massing form should be congruous to the neighborhood and the traditional and the traditional neighborhood. Um, number four, the volume of the L-shaped mass should be in plane with the piazza. And number five, further details are required for subsequent reviews, which goes without stating that the general um, the general intent behind staff discussion on this building did relate to the L portion being in plane with the piazza. We felt that that was a significant um, 
or closer in plane with the Piazza. We felt that was very significant. And uh, the staff recommendation is for, def is, uh, for deferral uh, for massing only. And I'll proceed uh, to House B. Um, number one, the general architectural direction uh, should be restudied in its entirety. Um, we think that the roof pitch is not a common element in the city and is inappropriate as a, an, as, as a means to conceal the half story. Um, number three, we think the building should be sub more subordinate to building A and not extend beyond the east side of building A. Uh, number four, um, revise the concept and submit complete conceptual level drawings. And number five, um, provide a site section for subsequent reviews. The staff recommendation is for denial as submitted for staff comments. Okay, thank you. Um, Kevin, would you like to clarify or respond to public and or staff comments? Yeah, just a few comments, I guess. Um, uh, one, um, the front house, house day with the traditional, very traditional um, Charleston single house. I think the street um, is such a hodgepodge that it could use a little clarity when it comes to traditional architecture um, and just have something that's refined and, and coherent, um, considering the range that's what's there and what's been added uh, and subtracted and built up over time. Um, the scale of both of the buildings has been downsized. I do want to address that the, we originally had looked at a larger development or more houses on the development, um, which actually did meet some or met some of the zoning requirements. And so it, this has been downsized already um, or downscaled, I should say, already. Not that that's um, necessarily a, a reason to approve it at this scale, but we are uh, wanted to point out that we are cognizant of the scale of the, the, the street and the context that it sits on. And then the back um, house, House B, I, I, obviously it's a change and it's a drastic change to what has been, um, what is in the neighborhood. But I also think that is an opportunity to do something different. There is, as mentioned, a range of architectural styles, both good and bad over the years. And we are looking to add to that and not just fall in line lockstep with what's been done before. Um, and so that's why our, where the, the idea and some of the, the design intent came from the back house. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's go to uh, board discussion. I think maybe Glenn, you were up. Uh, if you wanted to take the lead and get us into discussion, whomever. Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, thanks, Jay. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm I'm in the same boat as some of the commentary about struggling a little bit with with A versus B. Um, I'm not at all opposed to B being a little different and having some different detailing and different materials, but I, I think there is some definite open-ended. Uh, materiality and detailing that that, that I, I feel like I would need to know more about truthfully. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll continue. This is Julia. Um, I agree. I mean, I certainly don't want to discourage creativity and I do think the dependency house so to speak is a an occasion to make some departures from what would be expected um, but right now it just I, I mean it feels like the two houses need to they need to meet for like a beer summit and like you know just become friends because they don't seem to really know each other Uh, um, Fillmore. Uh, Fillmore here. Um, uh, I think I, I am on board generally uh, with staff. I think the general architectural direction of the front house is probably okay. Um, I also agree that the that the massing needs needs some work. Uh, I agree that the the L needs to be pulled back. Um, the house 
is pretty tall, but looking at the streetscape, a couple of houses down, there's a house that's almost as tall as that. So, uh, so uh, in that direction, I have a little less anxiety, but I do think the massing um, is too great. I think the back house um, uh, is not subordinate. It's uh, uh, almost as tall as the front house within a few inches of being as tall as the front house. And uh, uh, the fact that it, uh, it might protrude past the side of the front house visually, I have less concern with if it were smaller, if it did not, uh, and if that massing that you could see didn't tend to tower over the front house. So I am uh, generally in line with staff on this. Um, this is Bill. I would say I, I concur with a lot of the comments that have been made. Um, I also do concur with the comments from the Preservation Society that I think Building A probably should ease up a little on some of the traditional detail, while Building B probably should ease, ease off of some of the contemporary or definitely a, a more thorough investigation of materiality to Glenn's point should be, uh, should be investigated. Um, so I think it's, and that all summarized probably by Julia's point of the two need to be a little more congruous um, in composition. They don't have to necessarily be, um, you know, of like architectural style, but they should be a little more compatible. Um, and I believe uh, building B to Fillmore's point, subordination of building B uh, potentially in, in mass would, uh, I believe, allow some flexibility as far as the visibility from the side. I do agree with that point too. All right, so somebody at this beer summit needs to buy the guy who makes a, a motion out of all this. This, this is a tough motion here. Um, so you might want to take a stab and make any thoughts. I mean, because A, A, like what you do with A drives B. And so it's kind of hard to, um, you know, I don't be, be, be as clear as you'd like to be uh, with the general architectural direction of B other than to say, bring it in line with A, I guess. Um, Y'all seem to be okay with staff recommendations on massing on A. Um, I, I'm struggling here to try to put it in words of a motion. Yeah, I, 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 Jay, my only additional comment is that, it's Glenn Gardner, by the way, I, you know, I don't want to imply that A and B need to match. Um, I, I am fine personally with B having, having some of its own character. Um, so I, I just want to be careful with that. Of, of not requesting a, you know, a duplicate. I think I, at least I got that out of the board. So maybe that's just board. You can you can soak up the board's thoughts on it, uh, and then, you know, if you're restudying the architecture, it's clear it doesn't have to be. It can be it can be different. It can be a different style so long as the two sort of relate to one another in some level. Um. I'll, I'll try um, for house A. I'll make a motion for deferral for mapping and architectural direction with um, board comments. And well, actually, strike one, strike comment one, board comments two through five. And I'm sorry, staff comments two through five and a board comment to avoid replication of historic of a historic house of historic detail. Um, maybe maybe let's pause there real quick before we get to B. Does any anybody want to? Chime in on A. Any any thoughts on A? Julie, could you could you repeat the uh, staff comment? I didn't quite get it. Sorry. Um, so that that motion was for deferral for massing and architectural direction with staff comments two through five, 
and the board comments to avoid replication of historic details. Okay. And we have to include both of these in a single motion, is that correct? I think so, since they're both part of the same application, we need to deal with both of them. I, I just thought Fillmore would be easier to, you know, in terms of discussing what a motion's gonna say to, to pick them apart. And, and we'll get to B in a sec. So I was just pausing on A to see if there's any other thoughts, reactions, et cetera. Um, I don't have if, anything in addition to that. Yeah, if not, we can move on to B then. Julia, you want to take B or has anybody got any thoughts on B? Um, I don't know. I guess it would be denial as submitted, but I wouldn't want that to be construed as harsh um, discouragement. It's an interesting concept, but I think it's, I feel like it's probably going to need to, to change pretty dramatically. So if we're talking about height scale mass general architectural direction for, for B, then I think on, on general architectural direction, you know, we, it, we, we like the fact that it's differentiated from A, but we want it to be you know, in terms of the direction to go a little closer to A than where it is now. Is that as much as we can say? <clears throat> can we say anything? I'm just trying to give the applicant some direction. I here. know. Yeah. I mean, as submitted, I think it does have to be denied as submitted for staff comments. Um, but hopefully the applicant is soaking up, yeah. Inferring that, you know, we don't want a Disney World design here. Um, would, would you say denied as submitted per staff comments, meaning, meaning the reason for the denials, all of general direction, architectural direction, height, subordination. I mean, I guess maybe that's really, really it. It's, it's height and GAD. Well, yeah, and I, to harken back to the comment that April made, I think it really would be helpful if we saw some, some better indication of the relationship and three dimensions between the front and the back. So I'm not, as positive about the height and the extension beyond the east side. But I mean, I think as submitted, I would just fall right in line with what staff recommended. Okay, so basically the motion for B would be something like denial as submitted, uh, I guess per staff comments really then. Um, has anybody got any other thoughts on, on B? I think technically as submitted, I understand that. With nothing further, so denial is submitted, period. What I'm trying to figure out is if, if we need to, if, if we're sort of adopting staff's rationale for the denial, um, or I mean, we don't have to, I'm just trying to give clarity if we can. Well, uh, this is Bill. I, I, I would assume what I'm what I'm interpreting from staff's comments is it would be a denial based on staff's comments and height and general architectural direction. That's what I got out of it, and they want more detail. The 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 concept and you know complete conceptual level drawings. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, is that how the motion stands right now? It's a, it's a, it's a motion for denial based on staff's, uh, staff's comments 
Yeah, it's exactly the staff recommendation is what I figure yes. out there. Okay. So, so here's what, Julia, what I think you've made a motion was to, as to how say as a deferral for massing and general architectural direction uh, with staff comments two through five and a board condition to avoid the replication of historic details. And as to house B, denial submitted for staff comments. Can I, can I just change um, my, the board comment for house A to avoid attempting to replicate a historic house? Otherwise, yes, you're absolutely correct. All right, so then the board condition on A was to uh, avoid attempting to replicate an historic house. Um, otherwise, is that your motion that, that, that captured it? Yep, okay. Does anybody want to second Julia's motion? Uh, yeah, this is Bill. Okay, so Joy made a motion, Bill seconded it. Y'all don't seem to be jumping up and down in protest, so I'll call it for a vote. Um, okay, Bill. Yay, yeah, fair. Bill Moore. Uh, nay, opposed. Julia. Yay, yeah, in favor. Glenn. Yay, yeah, in favor. Chair votes, yay, yeah, in favor. So the motion carries uh, four to one. All right. So next agenda item is 85 spring. Okay. We are down to the home stretch here on this agenda. Um, item number 13, 85 Spring Street. This is a request for final approval for installation of solar, solar panels on a roof. This is a category four structure in Canterbury, Elliott Borough. It was built around 1910. It's in the old city district. Um, this is a location you can see here on the south side of Spring Street, close to Spring and Ash. And just a couple of images here of the building itself, existing site photos. Um, sits right next to a small one-story building and a two-story building on the other side. And here's just the photos looking down Spring in one direction and the other. Um, it's just historic images and survey card of the building. You can see it had its upper, upper uh, porch filled in at some point. And uh, after that brief uh, intro, I'll turn it over to the applicant for presentation. Okay, we have Jackie Giffen as the applicant, and she should be able to speak. Hi, it's Skype in, but doesn't matter. Um, yeah, Sorry. so we no problem. We are presenting um, this this application on behalf of our customer that would like to install solar panels on his roof. Um, it's 20 panels. They are, it's 10 and 10, so it creates um, a rectangle. They are flush to the roof and the conduit will be able to be run down the seam of the house. So there will be little visibility. Um, it can also be painted if that is necessary and there will, the conduit will not be um, visible on the roof itself. And there is already a um, panel system installed a few houses down, I believe on 97, uh, at 97 Spring Street. Can see when looking west down the street, uh, just beyond this house, this property. And that's all I got. Thank you. Can you, how, how will these be affixed to the, um... Are they, they clamped onto the to the metal? How yeah. Are they fixed? Uh, we did have. Do you have the um, application I had sent I over? Do. Okay. So if you can see this, you can just tell me to advance, and we'll um we'll go wherever you want to go. Okay. Keep going. Keep. So this is the design, uh, how it will look, and if you keep going, please. All right, there we go. Um, they, oh, one more, okay. So they will be put on with these brackets, the um, S5 and the exclamation point is silent. Um, and this is how they will be attached to the roof.
So those are those screws that penetrate the roof, providing brackets maybe over over the standing seams, and then the panels are mounted on top of the brackets. Yes, um, and from our site survey that was done, it looks to be a corrugated roof and not standing seam. Um, if it is in fact standing seam, then we could, there are different brackets that would be used that do not penetrate the roof. Um, but from what we've, from our site survey, it looks to be a corrugated roof. But again, that can be changed if that's not actually the case. Um, but yeah, if it is what, what the survey said, then we'll be using these um, that are screwed roof and then attached to the panels. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any questions? Um, yeah, I was just going to ask a clarification on the age and the condition of the existing roof. As far as I can tell, it's a, an original historic turn metal roof that's in pretty good condition, but I just wanted to ask the applicant to clarify that. I'm sorry, What what is the question? Could you repeat it? If you could just clarify the age and the condition of the existing roof and the material of the existing roof. Oh, uh, I don't have that information. Um, I can certainly try to find it for you. And I don't have that information available. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I think other we might have the owner of the property in the meeting. Um, I'm not sure if he would want to try to answer that question. Uh, no, I he's. I don't believe he uh, is here. Did he? Um, it looks like oh. we have uh, Stephen Ramos oh, um, okay. as an attendee. Um, I, I will allow him to speak if he's able to speak to that. Uh, yeah, this is Steve Ramos. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, great. I uh, wasn't sure if I would be talking. Uh, so it, it is, to my knowledge, a turn metal roof. Um, Thank you. From what I from what I can see, it appears to be in good condition. We have not had any uh, known leaks, although we've only owned the house for a year. Uh, but it appears to be in pretty good condition. I have a. Quick question. Um, do you know if the roof has been coated from the photographs? It looks like it might have been, but it's, I can't tell exactly if it's been hydrostopped or sealaflexed. Yeah, I, I believe so because it has that red coating to it. Um, but I have not been on, I have not physically been on the roof myself. Thank you. All right, there's no other questions. Let's go to public comment. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, real quick. Uh, Jacob, could you go back to the plan that shows the panels on plan? And I wanted to make sure I was oriented correctly. So the street is towards which end of this drawing here? The go back one more. If you go back one more, there's the street is on the plan, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Alex, could you bring on public comment? Yes, we'll, let's see, we've got Aaron Minigan. Give me just a second. All right. Thanks, uh, Aaron Minigan, Preservation Society of Charleston. Uh, while we are certainly not opposed to seeking energy efficient solutions, when it comes to historic buildings, such alterations needs, needs to be as sensitively as possible. Per the Secretary of the Interior Standards, new alterations shall not destroy historic materials that characterize property. Our foremost concern with the request would be the high visibility of the solar pan panels over the adjacent one-story building, but also potential impacts to the historic turn metal roof. We request the board defer this request to allow the applicant to study arrangement of the panels on the roof to be as minimally visible and invasive as possible. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, any other public comment, Alex? No other public comment. Okay, we'll do staff uh, recommendations uh, and comments. Very good, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the staff questions have been answered in the course of discussion. They relate to the mounting bracket and the nature of the roof itself. Those have both been answered by the applicant. Um, in regards to staff comments, number one, um, as has been said, the proposed panels will be highly visible from the west side, um, which probably makes them good as solar panels. Uh, number two is that the staff typically recommend locating panels on lower and conspicuous roof slopes to minima minimize or eliminate the visibility. Um, if there are no large expanses of roof that meet that criteria on the house. Um, so what we are saying is that we're okay with the location because that's where it has to be for solar panels. Um, and number three is that furthermore, if mounting the panels would damage the historic standing seam metal roof, uh, the proposal is not appropriate. and we recommend that an alternative mounting system should be restudied. So the staff recommendation is for final approval of staff comments noted and final review by staff. And just clarify and read into the record, it does appear that the proposal pierces what is an original term metal roof, which is not appropriate. So if you all saw fit to approve, we would work with the applicant to establish a method which clamps onto the standing seam with no piercing of the historic metal roof, which is a system we have seen and used before. That is, if you, if you choose to approve it, um, and with that, I will conclude uh, staff comments. Okay, thank you. Um, Jackie, you wanna say anything in response to public or staff comments? Uh, no, I would just say, um, but since the uh, design is approved, that's fine because should we try to push them back, it will be two separate arrays, um, which is obviously not ideal because then we'd have to run the conduit. So, but since it's approved, um, yeah, that's really it. Then um, I can have the engineers as well as the surveys, you know, site surveyors to get confirmation. Um, and if it is in fact a standing seam roof, then uh, like I said, we do have brackets available that into the roof and don't penetrate. Okay, thanks. So uh, let's go to uh, board discussion. Um, Bill, would you mind kicking us off here? Uh, yeah, this is Bill. Um, so I guess a couple of things. I, I, I'm in agreement with uh, staff's comment about the alternative uh, mounting system. Definitely should be investigated. Penetrating the term metal roof is not appropriate. Um, and also, um, it does appear that a, the array is forward on the house, closer to the street. Um, also, I don't know if that small, it looks like there's a small shed roof on the rear of the house, which would be more or less Southern exposure. If that little roof is big enough to facilitate any uh, panels mounted on it. Uh, um, so be, oh, sorry. I'll call, I'll call it a question, if you can answer that, Jack. Uh, yeah, if you'll give me just a moment. Um, right there, so, Right. Um, even if it was uh, suitable for panels to go back there, it would only fit about two. Um, and again, that would create two arrays, which creates more of a conduit, a longer conduit run, which would most likely be more visible. And the reason they can't go back any further is because you'll see that small circle there, um, which indicates um, a vent or something there. Uh, so they can't get back any further. Um, and then that smaller one, I, yeah, it, it wouldn't hold enough panels to, um, you know, create an efficient system. Well, uh, okay, then my, my follow-up question to that would be, is this then a matter of convenience of uh, compact installation? Is that what you're describing, rather than physically not being able to do it? Uh, well, I mean, this is the most efficient one. It, it, like I said, those two, I, I don't have the um, specific uh, engineering specs to know if that would be viably possible, um, that, the, that back panel or that back roof array. Um, but just by, you know, from my experience looking at it, it wouldn't hold enough panels for an efficient system. I mean, are you tr are you asking if we can make just move two of them back there, or do you want like the whole system to only be there? 
Well, I guess I'm ignorant to what I'm seeing on the plan, but the question would be what I'm looking at here on the, how many panels am I seeing here on this plan right here? Am I, am I looking at what? Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, or am I looking at 11? What am I looking at? It's 20 panels, two rows of 10. So I guess what I'm wondering is why only two can fit on that back roof. It looked like you probably get at least maybe eight of them back there, maybe 10. Do you mean that that very back part that's like this 24 right there? Okay, yeah. Um, right, be a shed, south facing shed roof. Yeah, I mean, there's also, um, you know, restrictions based on code on how many you can put somewhere or how far they have to be um, from the edge and from the, um, you know, that the actual house itself. So again, I don't have the exact specs for this, um, but there's, I, I mean, there's, I don't think that there it's possible to get more than, a, cause they would have to go the other way. They would be most likely put on there um, vertically. Okay. I mean, I mean, horizontally, I'm sorry, horizontally. Okay, I guess, I guess the main reason I, I sort of bring it up is to ask if it's feasible and ask, ask if it's feasible to potentially locate as many panels as far away from the street as possible because the point of fact that it, it will be seen over the one story building um, as you proceed um, up Spring Street. Um, so the question would be how many of these can be tucked away as invisible as possible. And I think that's actually one of the charges that was read into, I believe Jacob had stated that's a policy statement of, of the board to make them this inconspicuous as possible. So that in conjunction with a different type of bracketing system you had mentioned that doesn't penetrate the roof, you know, my thought initially would be potentially a deferral on this so we could get all that information, potentially investigating alternate positions for the panels and also the alternate clipping system for the roof. But that's that's kind of my position. Okay. Um, then I would say no, it's not feasible to to move the system to that back part. Yeah, so to Jackie, we're just, we're in board discussion. We we had to ask you a question, but um, so sit tight and let us just keep talking this out. Um, that's sort of where we are in the meeting. Tree um, Glenn Gardner, um, if I can give my quick two cents because my prepaid internet card is about to run out. Um, the panels I think are better to be all grouped in one like location instead of spread around the building. Um, I mean, I've studied this myself for my home on a historic turn metal roof and it's all about the clips. So I, I feel confident that that could be worked out with staff. I trust staff to, to verify the roof. I, I have been looking at the photos online. It's clearly a turn metal roof with a coating on it. So that can all be handled. I think it's staff. And, you know, I, I think the position of the building uh, to to its west will really help somewhat obscure the quantity of panels. And then finally, I I get it with regard to the number of them because they, you have to have enough of them to do their job to make it economically feasible to do this. So um, I, I am frankly supportive with a um, an approval with details to staff. Um, I, this, staff, sorry. Sorry. this is um, Julia chiming in and um, personally I have no issue with visibility of solar panels. I think they're a badge of courage and I think we should see more of them. Um, so and usually when I see anybody applying for this sort of thing I want to be like Renee Zellweger and be like you had me at solar but um, but we've had this same conversation many times about the turn metal situation. And it's not a standing steam room roof like you would expect to see on a new commercial building. Those seams are really short. And I, I, in my experience, there hasn't been a modern clip that can attach to them successfully. That said, I mean, I personally am at peace with there being penetrations in this roof um, and, you know, with staff reviewing it, um, and I 
generally, I'm always a huge proponent of solar, even on historic buildings, especially on historic buildings. Yeah, I, uh, Fillmore Wilson here. Um, I'm going to go back to some of Bill's comments. I think um, uh, I don't want to come across as not supporting solar. I am I am very uh, supportive of alternative energy sources. I think though that that we don't really have uh, guidelines for this established yet, or at least not clear ones. Um, that roof looks like it's been coated maybe a couple of times. And I think that we don't have a lot of um, track record on, um, on the clips, on uh, old turn roofs um, that have been coated and whether they damage the coating and then potentially uh, damage the roofs. So I have some misgivings there. Um, I think um, I, I understand Glenn's comment that, you know, these things certainly work better when they are in a tight array all together, but I'm not sure that um, uh, there's been a lot of effort made to try to sort of minimize the visual impact of this. And I think um, the other thing is there hasn't been uh, a lot of discussion that I'm aware of about alternatives just to roof panels. There's some very inventive um, ideas out there for solar that that are an alternative to roof panels. And so I'm not sure that, uh, I'm not opposed to putting panels on this roof. I'm just not sure that this application has been given the due diligence that it might need. I, you know, I'm gonna come out on this with, with Bill and Fillmore and I'll allow Julia and Glenn to tell me I told you so. I, I think eventually I, I would approve solar panels in this house. I, I would like to go through the next, another step though of demonstrating that this is the either optimal way or the only way. And I think uh, Bill raises some good points about, you know, maybe it's uh, not as efficient to do it in other ways, but it gets the job done. It still, you know, leads to the same amount of electricity output. I would like to see a little more, I guess I would call it a study to see if an alternative location in a less visible location on the roof or, uh, and, excuse me, and the, the fastening system, if that's gonna do, if that's gonna work on a turn metal roof like this. Um, I, I just don't think we have enough information to give me comfort on those two points. So, so I would recommend we, we defer. Um, and I, I think eventually it'll be approved, and, but I just wanna go through the motion of seeing if, it's a, if it, there's a better location that's less visible from the public realm and does less damage to the roof. All right, so does anybody want to cast a motion? Uh, we might be split on this one, but anybody want to put a motion yeah. forward? Yeah, uh, this is Bill, I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion for deferral of uh, this application um, pending uh, submittal of a more appropriate mounting bracket system uh, in, in um, compatibility with the uh, turn metal roof and also an investigation of um, most, um, let's say, less visible positioning for the panel placements themselves. Okay. Alex, did you understand that for, uh, for purposes of preparing the motion? Bill, could you repeat the second half of the motion? Uh, that the positioning of the panels uh, be investigated uh, to uh, be installed in the less, the least visible position, of whatever I said, but most inconspicuous position. Got it. Bill, would you be open to staff being able to, to give that an approval if they check the boxes with regard to study and attachment or should we have it back to the board? Yeah, I mean, I think staff can. I, the only, I guess, question of that would I, would, I would like staff to at least tell us what conclusion came out of it, because as Phil, to Fillmore's point, we do need to sort of get some sort of policy statement together. And I guess another quick point I would make is I wouldn't let one plumbing 
vent or plumbing boot, you know, defer the entire placement of the solar array. Um, that thing could be put on a Studebent or something like that, end of story. So that's the other point I would want to make in that. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I agree. Okay, so Bill, your motion is, uh, Alex, you might need to help me here, but deferral to uh, provide details on the mounting bracket system and their compatibility with a turn metal roof and to study positioning the array or the or, or certain panels of the array uh, to a locate to the most uh, inconspicuous location available and with final review by staff of, of those two um, sort of additional details or additional studies is that correct if we word in if we word in a report back from staff that conclusion fine I would like to make sure we get that yeah, I don't, I don't want to, yes, uh, let's see here. Um, and a further board condition for staff just to report the findings to, to the board uh, so that we know for the next one. So I guess there's deferral with three board conditions and final review by staff. Is that, okay, so Bill, is that right? Yes. That's uh, is there a second? Second. Second, second by Philmar. All right, I'll call it for a vote. Um, Bill? Yay in favor. Fillmore? Yay in favor. Julia? Yay opposed. Glenn? Uh, yay in favor because of the clips. Um, and then chair votes yay in favor. So the motion passes uh, four to one. All right, next agenda item is uh, 198 Bay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. In home stretch here, uh, last two, and these are two unique ones. Um, this is a request for approval of a mural, and this is on a category four building. Uh, it's pre-1884 and it's in the Old and Historic District. And this is located just at the corner of Cumberland and East Bay Street. This is the restaurant that's known as Carmela's. It's uh, adjacent to the U.S. Customs House, and I guess it's right on the corner. So these are just a couple of images of it. Um, you can see here what the corner uh, of the building looks like, and this uh, clearly identifies the location of the proposed mural, which is on the, the north-facing side of the building. Um, these are just adjacent photos. It obviously sits uh, uh, adjacent to the Customs House, Category 1 building, and then the other corners have um, typical sort of uh, East Bay uh, buildings that you would find in the commercial, any commercial district in the city. And you can see the general height scale and mass. Um, a couple of Sanborn maps uh, showing this from 1894 and 1902. Um, and then we will, uh, with that, conclude the introduction and go to the applicant's presentation. All right. The applicant, David Boatwright, now be a panelist. And he can unmute himself. And... Can I be heard? Oh, I see. I'm here. <laughs> um, uh, in, th in this project and, and most uh, uh, previous projects I've done downtown, I've really based them more on old hand painted signs versus um, murals, uh, which never really existed in Charleston. Uh, uh, let's see, I'm not, I can't hear anybody else. Let me see. We can, we can listen, hear David. We can We're not can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, so I'll, I, 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 I add text, and, and I know I have to sort of balance that off with uh, um, not making a sign per se, because they've already uh, have a sign and I, I'm aware of the sign ordinance, but, but I just think text uh, kind of ties it in historically and just gives another layer and, a, uh, you know, uh, but um, did we see the image yet? Mr. Bartwright, Mr. Bartwright, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Jacob, can you? Yeah, there you go. I just wanted, while he's talking, I wanted to see Great. the visual. Thank you. 
And David, I've got the presentation here. If you want to just tell me um, to advance the slides, I'm happy to do that for you. Okay. All right. Well, I, what what you see is what you get there. Um, and uh, I wanted I, they asked for it to be slightly aged, um, and I, I, that's there's a sort of smeariness to that. Now, that's that's something that's kind of hard to control. But but on site, um, I, it's just kind of a feel, you know, to make it blend in without uh, making it too ghostly. Uh, but I'm just, uh, I, I, this and the other project as well, it's just to, it's just to enhance their outdoor dining um, venue, you know, just to give it a little interest. And I, I, that's about all I can say, I think. Jacob, do we have a picture of their building frontage signage? Let's see if we can find it. Um, you, you can see it actually here, and I can zoom in just a little bit on this image. Uh, if you'll bear with me for one moment here to zoom in. Um, unless this is a little pixelated, unless uh, unless Mr. Boatwright knows otherwise, I believe this is currently the Carmela sign. Yeah, and it's pretty small. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have questions for Mr. Boatwright or right now? All right. Um, Alex, let's do public comment then. All right, we've got two uh, public speakers. We'll start with April Wood. Um, April Wood, Historic Charleston Foundation. HCF has an easement on 198 East Bay Street. The proposed mural comes under our purview. We have reviewed this application and have no objections to the request. Thank you. And we'll go to Erin Minigan. Thanks, Erin uh, Minigan, Preservation Society of Charleston. Uh, generally, the Preservation Society is not opposed to murals as a reversible measure. However, we do have concerns with this particular request. The mural is proposed in a highly historic context that will be perceived directly adjacent to the customs house and near the market sheds. Resources designated individually listed on the National Register and as a National Historic Landmark respectively. We do not find the design compatible with this sensitive context or the overall character of Charleston. And so we would encourage further study of the design and color palette that is more subtle, refined, and locally inspired. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, we'll do staff uh, comments and recommendations. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, staff comments are first, the zoning ordinance gives the bar more authority to scrutinize proposals in the old and historic district. And number two, the proposal for the mural directly relates to the use of and is an advertisement for the business and is therefore considered signage by the zoning ordinance. And that, just to clarify, um, we did look further into that, and it's, it's not simply just a matter of including the name or the address. So we, we do consider this to be, uh, in effect, a, an advertisement or signage. Number three, um, the ordinance only allows for facade signs on facades facing a public right-of-way or facades with a public entrance. So other examples of similar mural signs in the neighborhood are facing public rights-of-way. And furthermore, this proposal is in a highly visible location on a building that faces a Category 1 building. Um, last, if the mural were modified to remove any reference that could be interpreted as signage, the color palette were simplified and size reduced, the city might be more comfortable supporting the proposal. So as proposed, staff recommends deferral with the staff comments noted. Okay, great. Um, Mr. Boatwright, you're welcome to respond to anything you've just heard or clarify. Um, uh, I, I, I think that there is some uh, precedence for having uh, hand-painted signs in that neighborhood um, that uh, uh, the old Carol seafood sign is the, is the only one that comes to mind but uh, I, I, I you know I, th I feel like this is in the spirit of that kind of sign uh, I, I, I agree it's a it, you know it's a a balancing act not to be uh, too much of an advertisement and uh, if there were if there were no text at all would that be somehow more acceptable I'm not sure I, I fully get it 
Okay. Um, just, in other words, they're just images, no text. All right, so um, thank you. So let's go to board discussion. Um, <laughs> Bill Moore, I got you on my, my list here next, maybe to kick us off uh, and get into the discussion here. And I, I'm generally um, uh, in line with, with staff. This is a uh, really visible location next to a Cat 1 building. And uh, I think that there could be some decoration, some mural there. Um, I just think it has to be very carefully thought out and it has to has to fit well into the um, uh, into the uh, the streetscape and um, I don't have a lot of objection to this I think it's a very attractive mural I'm just not sure it's um, it's the right one for this exactly the right one for this location and uh, um, I keep reminding myself, of course, it, it is reversible, but it's unlikely to be reversed for a long time. So whatever goes there is going to be very visible and we're going to be looking at it for a long time. And I think it needs to be uh, very carefully considered. Um, um, this this is Bill. Oh, is there three speaking? Okay. Go ahead. Um, okay. Um, this is Bill. Um, I would say, uh, actually, uh, to Mr. Boatwright's last inquiry, yes, if the, if the text wasn't there, I, I, I would be much more amenable to the design. The design is beautiful. Um, and that might be part of staff's comment. I think the, the things that I would look at would be definitely the, the, um, the text. Although, um, and I don't speak, um, I assume that's Italian, so I don't speak it. Bevy en pensée. In cafe, I did it in French. Um, that part, I guess, doesn't bother me as much as it's a large Italiano at the bottom. Um, and if uh, I would think that design right there, uh, maybe uh, slightly reduced in size, and I did not ask Mr. Boatwright how actually how large is the large yellow circle where the lady's image is? Is that how far across is that? Is that five, six feet? Uh, closer to seven. Could be reduced. Yes, sir. So I guess what, I, in my own opinion, as far as a vote would go, I think if uh, some of the text graphic, say the big Italiano was removed, um, if the mural was slightly smaller and the yellow wasn't quite as punched, um, was subdued a little bit more, I really wouldn't have any issue with the mural. Um, right. This is Julia. and. I'm really feeling like the crazy left-wing justice on the court tonight, but um, I personally, well, first of all, is that not a public right-of-way to the north of the building in this location? Doesn't the sidewalk, just a technicality, seems like it functions at least as a public right-of-way. I'll, I'll provide an answer for you shortly. Okay, and um, so, I really have no look, no issue with the location or even the size or the aesthetics. Um, I think the figure is beautifully rendered. And I just humbly ask that if you do use text, um, you get the language right. Because as is, it really doesn't make sense in Italian. Or if it's like an inside joke or something, just at least put a little accent on the last E in cafe. But if the, if the text went away, that would be fun. And yeah. Ms. Martin, just to answer your question, um, this, this sidewalk is in fact within the right of way. It's a federally owned right of way, but yes, it is within the right of way. So the staff comment, um, is factually correct, but uh, it appears it does not apply, in fact. So, uh, good eye. It does face a right of way. Thank you. Any other thoughts, comments, discussion? Uh, all right. So, kind of a spectrum there of um, 
of opinions from, um, you know, Julie, I'll kind of peg you as good as is. You'd be willing to sort of accept it in the same form with, with that language and that would work. Down to well, not that language. Yeah, just yeah. The language. If, if you run it through the Italian translator and get it right. Um, and um, all the way through to um, maybe shrinking it and, and muting a color. But um, I don't know. I, I think I kind of come out on them like Bill. Um, just just a couple of tweaks here and there. And, and uh, I think it starts getting to, frankly, what I think staff is looking for too. So, um, so you might want to try to put it into the, put a motion into words here. Um, yeah, this is Bill. Um, I'll make a motion for a uh, deferral um, with uh, staff's comments. Uh, uh, number, let me make sure I get these right. Uh, the the right of way comment, I wanted to exclude that. I'm, I'm three and on four. four. Okay. And three. Uh, three and four, yeah. So staff comments one, two, five, and six. And um, board's comment that the uh, overall size of the uh, image be reduced and that the uh, text um, Italiano um, be removed and that the yellow color be muted. And final review by staff. Hey, Bill, since, since you added stuff on the my motions earlier, can I just tack on that um, if that other text is going to be there, it should be um, accurate, like correct grammatically? Yes, if the, if the other text is to remain, it should be grammatically correct Italian. Um, I appreciate it, Julia, because I don't know Italian. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I got Bill, I got a motion from Bill as for uh, deferral with staff conditions two, five, and six noted, uh, and board conditions to reduce the size, uh, to eliminate the, uh, the word Italiano written in yellow. To, to mute the yellow background and to make the remaining text grammatically correct. Um, let's see here. Was that coming, Bill? Is that final review by staff on that? Yeah, I said final review by staff. Yeah. All right, let's see if there's a second. Is there a second to Bill's motion? Mr. Gardner had raised his hand. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll second. All right. Uh, all right, I can't see Glenn. The Glenn's yeah, no, sorry. Yeah, Glenn Gardner, I second the motion. Okay, all right. So I'll call the roll. Uh, Bill? Yay, in favor. Phil Moore? Yay, in favor. Julia? Yay, in favor. Glenn? Yay, in favor. All right, Chair Vitz, yay, in favor. Uh, passes unanimously. All right, next gen item is 721 King. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 721 King Street, uh, approval for mural. This is on Category 3 building, 3, three minus, on um, the west side, uh, built around 1905. That's in the Historic Corridor District, um, north of the Central McClark Parkway. This is at the corner of King and Race Streets. This is uh, the building from, the, from King, mostly from the south, and this is the view looking south, and you can see the highlighted area where the mural is proposed right here. This faces Race Street. The restaurant is uh, Melfi's. Across the street, uh, a few of the restaurants uh, that exist in this district. And you can see that there are um, similar treatments on uh, other restaurants that are uh, immediately adjacent to this one. This is a Leon's restaurant, which has a, um, a paint, painted signage. Um, this is the historic survey card from 2003. And uh, with that, uh, we will go to the applicant's presentation. Um. Can you show the rendered uh, elevation? Yes, sir. Okay, thanks. Um, this building actually uh, had some uh, hand-painted signage uh, around the entrance, and uh, but I didn't think it was a, we didn't want to say drugs, you know, it was just 
word drugs uh, painted vertically. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I do think that it does establish that there were some hand-painted signs there. And again, this is just another project. Uh, this is where they want to uh, do some outdoor dining and just to, you know, add a little flavor to that area. And, uh, and also to harken back to the, uh, the drugstore days and so this is a completely made up uh, uh, product, but, uh, and uh, again, there's some aging on it. It could be more or less, you know, pushed one way or the other. It could be a little, a little more tatty, I think, but uh, this is it. This is what you see. So. Well, uh, what are the dimensions, uh, Mr. Batwright? Uh, ooh. Uh, off the top of my head, I think it's about 16 wide and about six tall, give or take a few inches. Okay. Alex, is there any public comment? No public comment. All right. How about staff recommendations and comments? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, we had just asked the simple question of what's the inspiration for the mural? Uh, is it based on an historic sign? And I think Mr. Bedwright did reference that there was a sign here, but Mr. Bedwright, if you care to comment on that, um, we just did have the question about what was the inspiration and it, whether this is based on the previous signage. Uh, well, just, just in the fact that it's a sort of pharmaceutical, you know, ad, uh, it, did, it doesn't directly, you know, uh, but, uh, but uh, I guess that Melfi was Italian and so I wanted an Italian looking figure there. And uh, again, I didn't want to put drugs, you know. Understood, understood. Thank you, sir. Um, the staff comments are that first of all, being in this district, uh, the criteria is less stringent than in the old and historic. Um, number two, um, the mural doesn't relate to the current business, but it draws its inspiration from the use and, and therefore is not considered signage uh, by the ordinance. Um, and we thought perhaps you could simplify the color palette and reduce size, although I would, I would encourage the board to have flexibility in that comment. Um, and I would just point out the, the alignment, you know, with the windows um, does have some, uh, some architectural appeal to it. So perhaps you could be flexible in your interpretation of number three. And in regards to the staff recommendation, we uh, recommend approval uh, with conditions and final review by staff. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Ms. Brett Wright, anything to clarify from staff's comments? Well, uh, as to the size, um, yeah, it does line up with those, those windows, but if it were really reduced, it would just be kind of, um, you know, just get lost a little bit in that sea of uh, gray. So uh, that's all. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we're in board discussion. Uh, Julia, would you please lead us off? Yes, I, I really like it. I think it's Awesome. I, I would, one question for Mr. Boatwright, is that, is that Caruso? <laughs> it is, um, <laughs> it is Caruso. Uh, the Melfi, uh, the, the original Melfi, uh, I, I believe was a Leo, though I took his name and I, awesome. I, I don't know, that's Caruso, yeah. You're, that's you're pretty sharp with your Italian. Yeah. I really like it. Good, thank you. Um, I, I like it, Glenn Gardner. I like it. I, I, I've struggled a little bit with the words because of the fact that this building already has, and I know that this technically, I guess, isn't a sign, but this building already has two signs, which the board has already dealt with in another year. Um, and I frankly still take a little bit of issue with that. But I don't really know that all the wording is necessary, but, but design-wise, I'm not opposed to something being here because the, the three windows always have looked a little odd and lonely. I almost wish it were three separate murals, David, underneath each window, more as a placeholder as opposed to one gigantic banner, but that, that's only my position. The other uh, board discussion comments. Uh, this is Bill. I, I like this. I like the composition of it. Um, 
I guess to Glenn's point, I, I do think that's encouraging uh, thought, Glenn, uh, about either three panels. But if it is one and you're talking about less lettering, I don't know which lettering it could be, maybe premium quality or something up there. Um, but it's a really nice composition. Um, and I know it will be executed beautifully, so don't really have any doubts about that. Um, Mr. Boatwright had presented the, the potential of, I don't know the word you use, but to age it, whatever it is. Um, I think I'm encouraged by that. And to the degree it might just be the boldness of the red, if you could patina that down to look more like it's been aged a little bit, weathered, if you will. Um, but I think it's a great composition. Um, so anyway, that's it. I'm in agreement with staff's uh, directives. Yes, um, I think it's, I like it. I think it looks nice there. I have uh, nothing to add. So if, if y'all are leaning towards staff and, and, and staff's encourage us, encouraging us to take number three <coughs> with a grain of salt, I guess that really means on the size component. Do we, I, I think basically I'll agree with you guys. I, I think staff's got to figure it out and I, I'll listen to them and maybe ignore the reduce the size component. Uh, is that what y'all are thinking? I mean, I think that in that location, I think the size is probably okay. I, th I think if you shrink it, uh, I, I agree with Mr. Butler. I think if you shrink it down too much, it's, it's, it, it's going to look, you know, uh, insignificant on the wall. Yeah. Yeah, Phil Moore, I agree. And it almost looks like the, that pallet was right there available under those three windows. Um, it aligns well. There might have been an old sign there in the past. It looks like it teed up for the, Basically, staff comments one and two are just not, they're not really comments. They're just kind of telling us what's going on. And if we change three, we might as well just say approval with whatever, you know, comment you want to make as a board. And, and I think we're okay on the size. It would just be if you want to do anything to the colors. I think they're good. As is? I mean, he's already indicating a little bit of patina that he's going to look into. Yeah. Um, I, I would make a motion for um, approval, final approval. Final approval, okay. May I, may I ask? It's, and it might just be the graphic representation. The red's pretty vivid. You know, if the red could be toned down just a little bit. Um, it might physically come off that way just to weather it, weather it a little bit, so it's not quite as vivid. Absolutely. Um, do we have them? You so, can make a motion, Bill. No, so I was just asking if you would want to add that to yours, Julia. All right, so. I think, I think Bill or somebody made a motion uh, for final approval with board condition to just tone down the red slightly to make it less, slightly less vivid. I'll second that. Okay, so Bill made the motion, Julia seconded it. Uh, I'll call the roll, Bill. Uh, yeah, in favor. Bill Moore. Yeah, yeah, in favor. Julia. Yeah, in favor. Glenn. Yeah, in favor. Uh, chair votes yay in favor, so the motion passes uh, unanimously. With the caveat, right. Right. Uh, All right. Thank, I think thank you very much. That's it. We're all exhausted. That's that's the longest board meeting I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think we've had one that that went to ten o'clock before. Uh, but I think we got pizza. That's that been time. a while. Yeah, yeah, that one that's, we split that's up. That's fun, right, Jacob? It shouldn't it should be as red as my face looks right now. It's just some. It does look purple. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, does remind, it does remind <laughs> me of the old days of BAR when they would go to midnight. I don't miss those days, but uh, job well done, everyone. Uh, you made it through with uh, with a, a really coherent set of, of recommendations. So. Okay, um, so do I get a follow up email telling me, you David, know? We'll, we'll follow up with you. Staff will follow up and we'll, okay. we'll get you all set up. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Well, Thanks. You guys have a good night, and we'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. Good night. Yeah.